Ürünü bu sefer. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee Comstack public meeting today in a very warm summer. Uh, very warm summer DC. Uh, welcome to you. I'm James Hatt, Acting Executive Director of the Office of Strategic Management at the Office of Commercial Space Transportation in the FAA. And I'm honored to be the designated federal officer for this federal advisory committee. For those joining by Zoom, I recommend viewing this meeting in the speaker view, which can be accessed via the icons in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom screen. If you experience audio or video issues with the Zoom connection, I suggest moving over to one of the live stream links for this event. Uh, those are facebook.com forward slash FAA or on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash FAA news, uh, or on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash FAA news. Uh, again, for those of you in the Zoom room, I would appreciate you turning your video off during this entire meeting to save bandwidth. The host has muted you and you will not be able to unmute yourself. Uh, a note about the agenda and proceedings for today's meeting. This is the first public meeting of the Comstack. The newly appointed and reappointed members will be introducing themselves. The FAA will provide updates on recent activities of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation and formally present the tasks assigned to the committee. We will not be taking any additional public comments or questions today other than what has already been scheduled prior to the meeting for the Federal Registry Notice. To ensure questions or inquiries, uh, can get answered, please direct them to the FAA. Uh, I would ask kindly that you contact the FAA media office at pressoffice at FAA.gov. That's P-R-E-S-S-O-F-F-I-C-E at FAA.gov. And do not direct your questions directly to any FAA member. If you have questions for a CONSTAC member, please contact them directly or through their affiliated industry office. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as a designated federal officer for Comstack, I formally open this public meeting and welcome the members of Comstack and the public. Before turning this meeting over to the chair and the vice chair, we have a couple of messages uh, from the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and as there are just a few more people waiting to get in the room, let me pause here for just a moment and let the rest of the people join. Again, if you do have problems with the audio or video, uh, if this is being live streamed and it is also uh, being recorded for future viewing. So I'll wait just a moment for other people to get in the room and then I will continue on.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll go ahead and begin. I think everybody's in the room. Uh, for those coming in uh, in the last few moments, uh, if you do have problems with audio or video, uh, this is being live streamed on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, first to begin the, the Comstack meeting, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the Secretary of Transportation, Elaine L. Chow, who is unable to join us live this morning, but she has recorded a video message for the Comstack meeting. She closely monitors the commercial space transportation industry and is very excited uh, about the advances that are taking place. She is also keenly aware of the impacts of COVID-19 on this transportation industry segment. We are grateful for her leadership during this exciting time for the US space industry, as well as this very difficult time. So Secretary Chow. One moment, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties um, to be expected on a, on a Zoom meeting.
Welcome to the first virtual meeting of the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. Commercial space is an industry that will play an important role, not only in reopening our economy, but in opening up the limitless resources of the solar system. And another important step was taken when SpaceX flew an American crew to the space station on May 30th. This was the first time Americans have gone into orbit aboard an American-built launcher since 2011. The launch also marked the very first manned launch into orbit aboard a commercial space launch system. When the NASA shuttles were retired, few could have predicted that America's return to space would take place on board commercial launch systems. In 2018, the Unity carried an American crew into space on a suborbital flight. Commercial rockets have carried supplies to the International Space Station. SpaceX has now carried an American crew into orbit. And this fall, we're going to see a new milestone for commercial space flight. An American crew will be launched into orbit aboard an FAA licensed rocket. In addition to these developments, other progress have been made that will benefit the commercial space industry. This past March, the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation completed its reorganization. These changes will enable the department to more effectively issue launch and re-entry licenses. This will help the department keep pace with the increased frequency of commercial space launches and other activities. Additionally, the streamlined launch and re-entry rulemaking is making excellent progress, and it will be finalized, we expect, this fall. When it's complete, the industry will benefit from new flexibilities rather than the previous bureaucratic, one-size-fits-all prescriptive regulations. There have also been some important changes here at Comstat, and I want to congratulate the new Comstat chair, Charity Wheaton. And now let me welcome nine new Comstack members. They're Shanna Dale, Karina Dries, who is a new Comstack vice chair, Mike French, Dale Ketchum, Kay Crow Miller, Mike Moses, Clay Mori, Lee Rosen, and Ann Sokolsky. Let me also thank the departing chair, Mike Gold, who served on Comstack for over a decade. He's now heading over to NASA, where he's going to serve as Acting Associate Administrator for the Office of Interagency and International Affairs. In addition, let me thank outgoing Vice Chair Michael Lopez Alegria, a former astronaut. He has provided valuable inside insight on human space flight and mission safety to Comstat. And let me acknowledge the other outgoing members as well. Brett Alexander, Rich Dalbalo, Deborah Factor, Oscar Garcia, Livingston Holder, Tim Hughes, Chris Comstatter, and Jennifer Warren. Thank you, past and present members, for your willingness to serve on Comstat and share your expertise in ensuring public safety while encouraging the development of the commercial space transportation industry. I hope you have a great meeting, and I hope that next time we'll get to meet in person. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am, for those great words to open Comstack. And indeed, we hope to see you in person at the next Comstack meeting, which is currently scheduled for September. Uh, introducing our next speaker, I welcome Kelvin Coleman, Deputy Associate Administrator in the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jim, and good morning, Comstack. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. Steve was sworn in by Secretary Chow on August 12, 2019 to serve a five-year term as FAA Administrator, overseeing the 45,000 employee workforce at the FAA, as well as the safest airspace system in the world. Steve joined the FAA after retiring from Delta Airlines, where he enjoyed a successful 27-year career. While at Delta, he served as a line pilot, flying the Boeing 727, 737, 757, and 767 aircraft. And he also flew as a Airbus 320 captain. And in his last stint at Boeing, he served as senior vice president of flight operations where he was responsible for the safety and operational performance of Delta's global flight operations, as well as pilot training, crew resources and scheduling and regulatory compliance. Steve is a strong advocate for aviation and aerospace safety and improvements in our national aerospace system to enable everything from drones to supersonic flight and of course, commercial space transportation. In addition to safety, his priorities are global leadership, operational excellence, workforce development, and innovation. For Steve, flying is a passion. He's been around aircraft practically his entire life. His dad, who is a 1955 graduate of West Point and former classmate of the Apollo 15 command module, uh, Al Wharton, uh, himself was a pilot. And Steve, following his dad's footsteps, went on to become a United States Air Force officer and F-15 pilot after graduating with distinction from the United States Air Force Academy in 1979. Steve's grandfather served in the Georgia National Guard and was an attorney. And his great-grandfather was the second graduate of Emory University School of Law in 1907. Steve himself earned a JD from Georgia State University's College of Law in 1999, magnum cum laude. I can tell you with firsthand experience, Steve is enthusiastic and attentive to the work that you do each and every day in this industry. Upon first meeting Steve during his preparations for confirmation as the administrator of FAA, I was singularly impressed with his knowledge of the industry and his passion for what you do each and every day. Uh, it was funny to note uh, persons in Steve's positions usually have a number of handlers who help with scheduling and things such as that. And so when this invitation was extended to Steve to take part, uh, he broke typical protocol and himself answered the call, elbowing, if you will, his handlers out of the way and saying, I will take that meeting and so I know he has a great deal of enthusiasm and he looks forward to presenting to you uh, his, uh, his speech today. So with that, I welcome Administrator Dixon uh, to the stage. Thanks, Kelvin. And uh, I appreciate your kind words. Uh, and uh, it, it's been uh, an incredible journey so far. Of course, we're all in encountering some challenges that we couldn't have imagined uh, a few months ago. But uh, it's an honor to be here with you, and uh, I'm very humbled uh, as well. I also want to thank uh, Secretary Chow uh, for setting the stage uh, for the event and for introducing uh, the new uh, Comstack members, as well as acknowledging the uh, 10 members who will be uh, leaving us. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm learning every day. You'd think uh, after 40 years in aviation, and, and around uh, aerospace issues, um, you know, that, that, uh, that you'd know a lot about the FAA and I'm finding out as, as Kelvin uh, sort of alluded to, that there's a heck of a lot to learn. And I think uh, many of you I know are lifelong learners as well. So it's a, it's a real privilege uh, to be with you this morning. 
You know, I'd like to um, echo the secretary's comments, thanking you all for your service uh, to the advancement of commercial space transportation. I'd also like to thank her and uh, my colleague, General Wayne Monteith and Kelvin as well for inviting me to say a few words today. Um, this, uh, another area that I've been learning a lot about is, is uh, reviewing uh, the, uh, all the material associated with uh, the new uh, streamlined launch and recovery rulemaking. That has been a great uh, educational opportunity for me to get uh, familiar um, with the uh, commercial space industry and, and all of your great work. For the, the new Comstack members, you know, we look forward as we do with any group of visionaries to an injection of fresh ideas, perspectives, and energy. My optimism for this group and the work that you'll carry out actually reminds me of a quote by Arthur C. Clarke, uh, who said, the one fact about the future of which we can be certain is that it will be utterly fantastic. And of course, we all know that a fantastic future uh, won't happen by itself. It's not gonna arrive by accident or luck, but, but by hard work and collaboration, especially when it comes to issues like safety. Um, I do believe that with government and industry working together, uh, with the brightest minds committed to exploration and moving humans into the solar system and beyond, there's no question that we'll get there. Um, think about how far we've already come in a relatively few, a few, uh, short few years since the first U.S. licensed commercial space uh, launches took place in 1989. Nine years later, in 1998, we celebrated the 100th licensed commercial space launch, representing an average of about uh, one launch per month. Nowadays, uh, as we all know, activity is ramping up considerably. We've got launches, and in some cases, re-entries averaging about three times per month, and we could almost double that number next year. And of course, uh, as the secretary said, we just witnessed an awesome uh, commercial launch here a few weeks ago, an American rocket carrying astronauts to the International Space Station, a capability we haven't had since NASA retired the shuttle fleet back in uh, 2011. The rapid growth and expansion of US commercial space transportation is really exciting and I know inspirational to all of us. There are now a dozen FAA licensed commercial launch facilities throughout the United States, as well as the Space Force and NASA ranges. All of them are primed to support a full suite of licensed operations, including of course, those by SpaceX, Boeing, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic that will transport people to and from space. They also stand ready, of course, to support ULA, Northrop Grumman Rocket Lab and others that will empty, uh, employ uh, new state-of-the-art capabilities to deliver an, an assortment of payloads to space. So there's certainly no lack of creativity in the suborbital and orbital vehicles launching from facilities in the US, as Secretary Chow described, and as everyone here knows. Now, as you also know, we at the FAA do not have the authority to directly set safety standards for space travelers the way that we do for air travelers. That's based on a 2004 congressional dictate, and there was good reason for that. The government wanted to ensure that this nascent industry wouldn't be overburdened by rules and would have an ample learning period to develop. That prohibition expires in 2023. But in the meantime, Congress did encourage the FAA to continue to work with the industry on ways to improve human spaceflight safety. And we have. In fact, 10 years ago, uh, then FAA Administrator Randy Babbitt retooled the agency's primary value statement to incorporate commercial space travel. Sp safety is our passion, read the new statement. We work so all air and space travelers arrive safe safely at their destinations. For myself, I've actually uh, started to refer to our national airspace system as our national aerospace system because we need to be obviously accommodating commercial space activity as well as UAS, which, which uh, wasn't uh, contemplated uh, when the system was designed uh, decades ago. So it's no secret that I've got strong feelings about ways to improve flight safety in the air and in space using tools that the aviation industry developed from the hard lessons of the past. Those tools and processes, namely safety management systems or SMS, have allowed us to succeed and thrive. Because of those efforts, commercial air transportation is by far the safest form of travel, travel on the planet. Since 1997, 
we, the FAA, along with the, uh, of course, the commercial aviation industry operators and manufacturers have cut the risk of a fatal commercial aviation accident in the U.S. by 94%. In the past 10 plus years, we've had two airline passenger fatalities on about 100 million flights. And those, of course, are still too, too many. We don't want any. Um, that's not science fiction. That's the science and practice of these risk-based, data-driven decision-making programs and tools. At the FAA, at airlines, and at a growing number of industries in the transportation business, we use SMS to identify, evaluate, and control safety risks. We're using it uh, even to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. It's vital that the processes be repeated until the safety risk associated with each hazard is reduced to an acceptable level. Getting data about your operation is a crucial first step on the path to safety enlightenment. It requires insight into your operation, which means collecting operational data and getting input from frontline workers and managers who feel empowered to voluntarily report errors and concerns. The workforce gets those assurances by way of a just culture from the top to the bottom in the organization. Always the visionary, Arthur Clark described the information backbone of SMS back in 2003. It's vital to remember that information in the sense of raw data is not knowledge and that knowledge is not wisdom and that wisdom is not foresight, he wrote, concluding, but information is the first essential step to all of these. So I think we'd all agree that those are words to live by, literally. The commercial aviation industry has proven it. Done correctly, an SMS supported by a just culture will generate the data that you need to figure out what's really happening in your operation. If you know about safety risks and know where threats are coming from and how er errors are occurring, you can mitigate those risks and fix the processes that led to any errors. This works for risks related to the machine and its operation, as well as atypical threats in the environment. I mentioned a minute ago, for example, right now the aviation industry is looking to SMS to help determine how the COVID-19 global health crisis is affecting our operations and what we must do to maintain the highest levels of safety. In the ideal, companies will be comfortable sharing their SMS findings to the broader industry in a protected manner so that everyone can benefit from the lessons learned by the individual operator participants, increasing safety for the entire industry and its customers. I know from personal experience that these concepts work. I saw them in action at Delta Airlines during the 12 years that I served as the Senior Vice President of Flight Operations. And as Kelvin said, I was responsible for the safety and operational performance of the company's global flight operations of more than a million flights a year on six continents. That kind of safety performance um, doesn't happen by accident. That's why I'm happy to see that the Comstack and your working groups are actively discussing a safety framework and voluntary safety reporting. This is a first step in, deve in developing risk management processes and ideally a full SMS. And that actually reminds me of another quote about the future. One of my favorites, that wise old sage, Yogi Berra. Predictions are really hard to make, especially about the future. So think about that one. You got to love Yogi Berra. Um, and I bet you never thought that you'd hear a quote uh, about from Yogi Berra and Arthur C. Clarke in the same speech. But Yogi actually reminds us of just how hard it is to manage that risk as the industry develops and matures. We've got to work together in a predictive, proactive way. So you've got my word that we at the FAA are here to help you in any way that we can along your path to a safe, utterly fantastic future. So thanks for your time uh, and your attention today. Thank you for listening. Uh, I wish uh, the new members uh, Godspeed in your work and uh, the Comstack uh, all the success in the world, and of course to your individual companies um, and, and organizations. And all of you, uh, I wish you an utterly fantastic uh, Comstack meeting today. Thank you. Sir, thank you for those um, utterly fantastic words. Your inclusion of space, as you reference the National Aerospace System, and we definitely appreciate you taking time out this morning from your very busy schedule to open up and support the first Comstack meeting under our new charter. Uh, next, it is my honor and pleasure 
to introduce the FAA's Associate Administrator <coughs> of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, Brigadier General U.S. Air Force retired Wayne Monteith. Mr. Monteith joined the FAA in January 2019 after most recently serving as the 45th Space Wing Commander at Patrick Air Force Base and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and was dual-handed as the Director of the Eastern Test Range. As Associate Administrator, he is charged with regulating the commercial space transportation industry to ensure public safety while encouraging, facilitating, and promoting the United States commercial space <coughs> transportation industry. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Monteith. Hey, thanks, Jim, for that kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first virtual Comstack meeting, uh, especially to those of you participating from the West Coast. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank a few people. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to thank Secretary Chow for her keen interest in and unwavering support of this critical transportation sector. And it's lo not lost on me how much more successful you can be when your boss is all in. And speaking of being all in, turns out our new administrator, Steve Dixon, is actually a space geek like us, which again makes my job so much easier. After he also binge watched the first season of Space Force, he now understands space is hard. But seriously, I'd also like to echo the Secretary's thanks to both outcoming or outgoing and incoming Comstack members, especially to the two Mikes for your tremendous dedication and leadership, and also to our new leadership team of Charity and Karina. I'm excited for what you will accomplish during your tenures. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Jim Hatt, Tom Murata, and our tremendous AST and FAA public affairs teams for making this virtual meeting possible. When we last got together, I had only been on the job about four months, and I was excited about the challenges before us. I can tell you I'm even more excited today about our future and the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead. Since we last met, AST has licensed 33 launch and reentry operations. SpaceX has hopped the Starship, put up 478 Starlink satellites, landed a bunch of boosters, and successfully ended our drought of being able to put American astronauts in orbit from U.S. soil. Rocket Lab successfully launched six times out of New Zealand and was even able to catch a stage one under canopy during a test. Virgin Galactic stood up operations at Spaceport America, and Virgin Orbit launched out of Mo the Mojave Air and Spaceport with a launch of one rocket tucked safely under its wing. Northrop Grumman continued their success at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, while the Pacific Spaceport Complex Alaska hosted Astra, and we granted a launch site operator's license in Titusville, Florida. When we last met, our proposed Streamline Launch and Reentry Licensing Regulation, or SLR2, had only been on the street for about a month. We knew that proposal wasn't the be-all, end-all, but with your help during the comment period, we were really able to hone in on where we could improve the proposed rule, and I am confident it is absolutely going to be better than the regulations we operate under today. We are currently in the sausage-making stage of the review cycle. And I can honestly tell you, Administrator Dixon and I have reviewed every single word of the preamble and of the regulatory text and provided personal comment and edits where appropriate. But I'll also tell you, we haven't had to provide many critiques because we have an incredible team and a dedicated team in the FAA and DOT working on this important and historic effort. SLR2 will enable us to unleash the incredible innovation in this sector and as I said last year, we will, we will deliver the right regulations at the right scope at the right time. And that time is now just a few months away. Since we last met, we now have a new Comstack charter, new work plans, new working groups, new members, and new energy. And for the first time in Comstack's 35 year history, we have females serving in both the chair and vice chair positions. I am already seeing great progress from this leadership team and the working groups, and I can hardly wait to see how much we can achieve together. 
As the secretary mentioned, last year she charged AST with undertaking a significant reorganization to increase our effectiveness, efficiency, accountability, and scalability. I am pleased to say we met the secretary's challenge to us, on time by the way, and we were already realizing the benefits of our efforts. And I'll talk more about the reorganization later in the program. We were also completely revamping all of our internal processes to maximize the benefits of the new SLR2 or part 450, while also eliminating all non-value added activities. Our goal is to be agile, flexible, expeditious, and accountable, all while ma maintaining our laser focus on public safety. And per our statute, while regulating only to the extent necessary. Finally, we continue to build our staff. We are bringing in tremendously skilled individuals to include recent college graduates to augment and robust our talented team of public service professionals. With the skills we, with the skills we anticipate we'll need to keep up with the cadence and complexity of the commercial sp space transportation industry. And by the way, we are still accepting res resumes. In closing, this continues to be an exciting time in our industry as we have companies like Relativity Space pushing the innovation and technological envelopes. Virgin Galactic on the verge of routinely flying spaceflight participants to space. Blue Origin building out a new launch complex on the space coast of Florida and a brand new rocket to go with it. Boeing readying their own crew rated Starliner capsule. SpaceX making the seemingly impossible appear routine on an almost daily basis. United Launch Alliance retooling for Vulcan while still flawlessly flying their current fleet. And just last week, Space Perspectives announced their exciting new initiative, operating stratospheric missions out of Kennedy Space Center. Finally, our NASA partners are once again heading to the moon and then to the planets beyond. What a cool time to be part of the commercial space transportation sector. We are in this together and I look forward to our continued collaboration as we forge ahead into the future. Thank you again. Thank you, sir, for your uh, support and great words. And also, um, I've got to say, having a boss that is all in does make your job much easier. So thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to formally introduce the chair of Comstac, uh, as she was appointed by Secretary Chow. Ms. Charity Whedon is Vice President of Global Space Policy at Astroscale US, coordinating and synchronizing Astroscale's global policy efforts towards spaceflight safety and long-term space sustainability. She brings a rich experience as an operator, manager, diplomat, and advocate for the space community. She has served as the Canadian Embassy Assistant Attaché for Air and Space Operations, as a Deputy Sensor Manager for the U.S. Space Surveillance Network at the U.S. Air Force Space Command, and Policy Officer at NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM. What an outstanding leader to chair Comstack. Ms. Whedon, thank you for your leadership. The meeting is yours. Thank you, Jim. I'd also like to send my thanks to Secretary Chow, Administrator Dixon, and Associate Administrator Monteith for the opportunity to serve as the Comstack chair. I'm also honored to work with a great FAA AST team and all our Comstack members. And this is our chance to tell the public a little bit about us. Uh, the members then of Comstack, this Comstack. I'm going to ask each of the members to uh, introduce themselves quite briefly, and I'll call your name. And if you can say a few words about your background, uh, that would be appreciated. I'd like to first uh, kick it off with Karina Dries, who's the vice chair of Comstack. A fun fact about Karina and I: we both attended the International Space University together over a decade ago. Uh, Karina, it, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much, Charity. And I really look forward to, to working with you this term. Uh, good morning. I'm Karina Dries. I'm the CEO and General Manager of Mojave Air and Spaceport. Uh, Mojave is home to a diverse set of aerospace and aviation companies, uh, including Spaceship Company, Virgin Orbit, Northrop Grumman, Strata Launch Systems, 
Scale Composites and the National Test Pilot School. I'm also a board member of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. Um, aerospace is my passion and I really look forward to serving as your vice chair this year. Thank you, Karina. Next, we have Major General James Armour, U.S. Air Force retired, who's currently the Director of Government Relations for Northrop Grumman. Uh, Jim, can you say hello? We are gonna come back to Jim. Let's go next to Dr. Greg Autry, who is the Vice President of Space Development for the National Space Society. Greg, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here, uh, starting my second term uh, with Comstac, uh, and uh, particularly happy to welcome uh, Charity and Karina, uh, uh, two people I've been proud to work with for many years. Uh, I am a researcher in uh, the field of management, public policy, and I've been studying the commercial space industry uh, for going on 20 years. Uh, I'm excited to note that yesterday was the uh, 16th anniversary of the Spaceship One flight, and I've used a photo taken uh, from a suborbital Spaceship One flight uh, is, is my background here. Uh, these are exciting days uh, uh, to be on the uh, safety working group, which I'm, uh, I'm proud to share. Uh, and I also served on the NASA agency review team uh, during the presidential transition and was excited to help set some of the priorities we're pursuing there now. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Next, we have Mr. Bill Beckman, who's the director for NASA programs at the Boeing Company. Bill. Okay, I got the unmute button found. I'm Bill Beckman. I currently work for Boeing, have been with them for about 33 years. Started off uh, in engineering, worked my way up, and currently I am supporting the, the Boeing NASA programs here in Washington, D.C. I've been proud to serve with Comstack, uh, filling in for someone that had uh, to leave earlier than anticipated. And I look forward. We've got a lot of great challenges ahead of us, and I look forward to contributing and working with the group. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Next, we have Ms. Shanna Dale. She's the former FAA Deputy Associate Administrator. Welcome, Shanna, for your first time on Comstack. <laughs> Thanks, Charity. Um, appreciate the opportunity. I have dev decades of experience in the Washington, D.C. area working for the federal government and also private sector in aerospace and homeland security, U.S. House of Representatives, NASA, Dell, FAA, commercial space, um, many others as well. I'm honored to serve on Comstack. I look forward to working with both you, Charity, and Karina. I also wanna say I'm delighted to be able to work again with Kelvin Coleman, the deputy AA for AST, a man on whom I relied very heavily while I was at FAA. Thank you very much, Charity. Excellent, thanks, Jana. Next, we have Mr. Paul Dampos, Vice President of Business Development for CalSpan Holdings. Paul. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Charity. Um, looking forward to your leadership and the Karina's leadership as we uh, restart. Uh, uh, Paul Dampos uh, had uh, a career in the uh, US Marine Corps as a uh, pilot and as a space operations officer. Uh, retiring out of the Pentagon and the National Security Space Office. Uh, shortly there before, uh, did a short tour as a NASA fellow working for Senator Bill Nelson at a very interesting time in, in NASA's history. Currently serving again as uh, Vice President of Business Development at CalSpan Holdings, which is a uh, family of, of companies doing very advanced uh, engineering, uh, research and development flight tests, and wind tunnel work from subsonic up to uh, hypersonic to include space access. Um, super excited about getting, uh, getting underway and super excited about the uh, infrastructure and innovation working group. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next up, Dr. Mary Lynn Dittmar, who's the president and CEO for the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration. Welcome, Mary Lynn. Good morning, Charity, and thank you. Looking forward to working with you and Karina. It's uh, an honor to return for my second term here at Comstack. 
It's also a bit of going down memory lane. I'm serving on the safety committee and um, it was on the working group for human operations that was touching on safety and also risk management um, back in the early teens uh, on Comstack. So it's kind of fun to come back here and, and uh, see how far things have progressed. Um, in addition to my work at Comstack and as the president and CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, I'm also honored to serve on the National Space Council's user advisory group and also on the Space Studies Board for the National Academies. And this gives me a vantage point where I'm sort of spanning everything in government and commercial. I actually began in commercial space as the chief scientist for commercial payloads for Boeing um, back in 2000. So um, it's just wonderful to have all this experience and be working with great colleagues and looking forward to it. These are very exciting times. Thank you, Marilyn. We're looking forward to leveraging your insights and expertise. And next up, Mr. Mike French, who is the Vice President of Space Systems Aerospace Industries Association. Mike is a new member of Comstack. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Charity. Uh, really glad to be a part of the group. Uh, my name is Mike French. I'm the Vice President of Space Systems at the Aerospace Industries Association. Uh, we represent about 300 companies uh, in the aerospace sector. I formerly served as NASA's Chief of Staff uh, as a commercial space market analyst and consultant and an aerospace attorney. I really want to thank General Monteith, uh, Mr. Coleman, and the, the whole uh, FAAST team for this opportunity uh, and looking forward to our work on the regulatory uh, committee uh, this coming term. Thanks, Charity. Thanks, Mike. Next up, we have Christopher Hassler, who's the president and CEO of Syndetics Inc. Chris. Good morning, Charity. Thank you, everybody. This is my second term on, on Comstack, and so it's an absolute pleasure to get to continue to serve. Um, I'm the president and CEO of a consulting firm that's relatively small, about 150 people. We support uh, mainly defense and intel operations, uh, some cybersecurity issues, and, um, and so we do a systems engineering business case analysis um, across a myriad of programs, including space, but many of them have required re-engineering and process reform and hope to bring some of that and those lessons learned to this, to this application. So it's going to be an exciting time. Enjoy working with you all. Thank you, Chris. Next up, we have Mr. David Carnes of Council, Kudak Rock. Uh, David, uh, Senator, former Senator uh, Carnes is a former Senator from Nebraska. Sir, over to you. Thanks, Charity and uh, Karina. It's, an it's a great opportunity to serve uh, my second term on the Comstat. I want to um, also thank uh, um, Secretary Chow. She and I um, have a spotty history together. Uh, we both served on the domestic policy staff for the White House. Um, under uh, President Reagan, and uh, then later on, I had an opportunity to um, to, to move to the United States Senate. And uh, when the Secretary asked me to participate in the Comstat, she indicated that one of the things that would be a priority would be making sure that we communicate properly with Congress. So uh, the opportunity for me, uh, as not a space expert like uh, all of you, which I'm very impressed uh, with the group that I have an opportunity to serve with is to make sure that, um, uh, particularly on the innovation and infrastructure working group, that uh, we have uh, an opportunity to communicate properly with Congress and make sure that they understand, as I think that they, some of them do, uh, the importance of space for our commercial future. So um, Charity, it's a, uh, it's a great opportunity. Congratulations on your new appointment. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with a very talented group and learning a lot about what uh, the future is for our country and for the world for, for space, commercial space travel. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Next up, we have Mr. Dale Ketchum, who's the Vice President, Government and External Relations for Space Florida. Uh, Dale is uh, new to the Comstack. Welcome, Dale. Thank you very much, Charity. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I, I guess my role here is really, I was wasn't born on the space coast but my father was the first city manager of cocoa beach when it was taken off with the space program and i had the opportunity to grow up with the original seven astronauts driving corvettes around cocoa beach it was a great place to be a kid um and i've been in the space business ever since i graduated from the university of florida i've been 10 years with rockwell on the shuttle program worked for the congress a uh, small business and was director of a research institute at UCF there at the Cape. 
I've been blessed to grow up with the U.S. space program as a, with a front row seat and to watch its evolution. I've, I've been here long enough to see literally thousands of launch attempts, and I'm encouraged to see us returning to a robust launch cadence and equally encouraged to see a return to a not afraid to fail mentality to drive innovation. Uh, I think the challenge is going to be integrating that with the proud legacy the FAA has of airline passenger safety and bringing that into uh, passengers going into space. So we've got a, a big challenge and an imperative in front of us, but I'm glad to participate. Thanks, Dale. We're excited to have you on board. Next up, we have Ms. Kate Cronmiller, who's the Vice President of Government Relations at Jacobs. And Kate is new to the Comstack. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Charity. I was fortunate enough to attend the first Comstack meeting as staff to Deke Slayton, who at the time was president of Space Services, Inc. Deke launched the Conestoga, the first privately funded commercial rocket in 1982. There was no way to get a license from the FAA AST at the time. Um, so we worked together with others in Congress to write the Commercial Space Launch Act, which President Reagan signed into law in 1984. I was fortunate to get to know Secretary of Transportation at the time, Libby Dole, who worked with some of us to co-found Women in Aerospace. Anyway, that's all old news. Um, I've been involved in industry for unfortunately decades, um, but I am so excited to see how far the industry has come since 1982. And I look forward to working with industry to make sure that as we go forward, we do it in a safe but also an innovative way. I'm thrilled to support Comstack and I'm very grateful for the appointment. Well, thanks Kate. And thanks for helping to launch the commercial space uh, industry. Next up, Mr. Steve Lindsay, Senior Vice President of Strategy and Programs at Sierra Nevada Corporation Space Systems. Steve. Thanks, Charity. It's a privilege to be part of Comstack again. I think this is my second term or third, no, second term. Um, so what I do is here in Nevada is uh, I have responsibility for the Dream Chaser program, which we hope to uh, get airborne here end of 2021, early 2022 or in production now. I also have responsibility here in Nevada for the small satellite group, uh, mostly involved in the Department of Defense and other areas, uh, as well as an advanced development group where we uh, are heavily involved in the gateway and lunar landers and different programs like that. Uh, my background uh, is more of an airplane guy. I started out in the Air Force as a fighter pilot and a test pilot, and I spent 16 years at NASA as an astronaut, uh, had the opportunity to fly five shuttle missions and help build the space station, and I've uh, been, been a Sierra Nevada for the last nine years, and uh, obviously we're very interested in uh, how this proceeds forward because we're going to be uh, looking for licensing here very shortly and are actively working with the FAA on now, and I do appreciate the support of uh, the FAA and in our licensing activities. And again, looking forward to the progress this group will make in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Next, we have Mr. Mike Moses, president of Virgin Galactic. Mike is a new member of Comstack. Welcome, Mike. I'm going to circle back over to Mike uh, at the end of the, the roll call here. Uh, next up, Clay Mowry, Vice President, Sales, Marketing, and Customer Experience at Blue Origin. Uh, many of us know Clay uh, in the community. This is his first Comstack. Thank you, Clay. Hi, Charity, and uh, thanks uh, to you and Karina for leading us in this group. Uh, so I'm a longtime Comstack watcher, but this is my first time, as you said, serving on the uh, organization. I'm really, it's a pleasure to serve as co-chair of the regulatory working group with Shannon Dale. I've been involved in this industry more than 25 years. Uh, started as a space analyst back in the Department of Commerce and then was the founding leader of the Satellite Industry Association. Fun fact, Cherry and I are both alums of SIA. Uh, then was at uh, Iron Space for several years and now about four years leading global sales at Blue Origin for New Shepard and New Glenn. So I'm really pleased to serve and to try to drive some regulatory reform and process improvement here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Clay. Next, we have Mr. Dale Nash, who is the CEO and Executive Director of the Virginia Commercial Space Flight Authority. Welcome, Dale. Thank you, Charity. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I uh, started my career back in the 80s uh, with Thiokol, building missiles and rockets out west. Uh, they moved me in the 
early 90s down to Florida to work on the shuttle program. I had the good fortune to spend 15 years down there with Thiokol and United Space Alliance, working with Kate and others, uh, 65 some shuttle launches. As the uh, shuttle program wound down, I ended up uh, relocating to Alaska to run Alaska Aerospace launching ro rockets and uh, missiles out of Kodiak. Then uh, Virginia came calling and it was much closer to uh, my family. So eight years ago, I, I moved to Virginia to run the Virginia Space Authority. It's a subdivision of the uh, Commonwealth uh, modeled after the Port of Virginia. We own and operate the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, co-locate Bill Wallops Island with NASA. We have three launch pads where we launch uh, North Grumman Antares, North Grumman Minotaur family, and a brand new launch pad for LC2 for uh, Rocket Lab that will begin launching here in a few months out of the US. We also have a state-of-the-art uh, payload processing facility we've completed, and then drone dedicated airfield out there. So. Uh, this uh, Comstack has, has got a lot of things that uh, we look at, and it's a pleasure to serve on it. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Next, we have Ms. Sharon Pinkerton, who's the Senior Vice President for Legislative and Regulatory Policy at Airlines for America. Sharon, welcome. Good morning, and thank you, Charity, and congratulations to you and Karina for leading the Comstack. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to be a part of this effort again. Um, and really appreciative of all of the folks here and the administration's recognition that uh, commercial aviation um, is certainly part of the national airspace system. And I'm really looking forward to continuing to learn from the vast knowledge um, that is represented um, on this advisory committee. Um, in my role at Airlines for America, I've been here for um, about 15 years. I'm the head of um, policy, so dealing with all legislative um, and regulatory issues that impact um, commercial aviation. That's We represent um, the big uh, cargo and passenger carriers. Obviously, um, like many of you all, we've uh, really been hit hard. Um, by this global pandemic um, and have spent a lot of time uh, in the past several months working with Congress and, and working with the administration to try and um, restart uh, the aviation industry. But just um, I'm really grateful for you all allowing me to be a part of these discussions um, and looking forward to learning so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Next, we have Mr. Lee Rosen, who's the Vice President of Customer Operations and Integration at Space Exploration Technologies. Lee is new to the Comstack. Welcome, Lee. Thanks very much, Charity. Really happy to be a part of this and looking forward to many great things um, with your leadership and with Karina as well. Uh, getting to serve on the, in, um, the Infrastructure and Innovation Working Group with uh, Paul and really excited about that. Uh, we've got some great uh, opportunities to improve the ways that uh, the FAA looks at uh, things like uh, research and development as well as um, the spaceport. So we're super excited about uh, this opportunity and um, I've been at SpaceX for about nine years now and uh, run our operations and integration group. Uh, we've got uh, two astronauts on the International Space Station that we uh, we'll bring home successfully and safely uh, here at the beginning of August, and uh, things are going well on that mission, and really appreciate everyone's uh, support of that. Uh, I've spent 23 years in the Air Force uh, serving alongside uh, General Monteith for much of that, and really appreciate his leadership in this whole thing, too. Uh, look forward to working with all of you, and thanks very much. Thank you, Lee. Next, we have Ms. Robbie Sabatier, Vice President of Government Operations and Communications for the United Launch Alliance. Hi, Robbie. Over Thanks, Charity. Can you hear me? Yes. It's great to see you, and I'm excited to be working with you and Karina um, as we, we move forward in this new ComSAC season. Um, I've been with United Launch Alliance for just over five years, but I started out with Kate Cronmiller uh, working on space shuttle uh, policy issues for human space flight and early in my career, and then uh, worked with Clay uh, Mori as well on on issues related to Ariana Space and our European friends. So, um, been in the aerospace industry and working in DC for many years, and and know almost all of you. So very excited. It's kind of like a reunion. 
I'm also very excited to be working with Greg Autry. Um, he is our chair of the safety working group. I'll be his co-chair as we dive into uh, the human space flight um, moratorium and what does a safety framework look like uh, as we advance towards kind of this new era. So exciting things going on and I look forward to working with all of you as we move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Next up, uh, Mr. Eric Stalmer, the president of Commercial Spaceflight Federation. Eric. Hey, Charity, thank you so much. Uh, it is a great pleasure to once again be working. Uh, this is my second term uh, with Comstack and to be working with the great team at the FAA, Wayne and Kelvin and, and Jim and the, the whole lot of them. Uh, we've had a um, just great opportunity over the past couple of years to work with them on the NPRM. So we're looking forward to that release. Uh, and, and how we, the industry is going to move forward. At CSF, we, uh, we're closing in on 100 members uh, in the commercial space uh, sector, so we're very excited about that. Every day in the news, you're reading something new about these commercial space companies, whether it be launch or spaceports or new companies emerging and startups uh, starting up and moving out uh, into operational companies. So it's just a really exciting time uh, to be in this industry. Um, I'm looking forward to working uh, on the regulatory working group. I think we've got a lot of work uh, ahead of us and cut out for us. So that's going to be a, an interesting topic area in these next few months. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing to work with so many of uh, not just colleagues, but really good friends um, here that I've been working with for uh, I have to give a number, I think well over 25, uh, close to 25 years. So it's, uh, it's great to see so many friendly faces on the comm stack. And I think uh, with this uh, brain trust that we have, we're going to really move the ball forward on a lot of uh, great initiatives. And um, looking forward to working with my partner, Mary Lynn Dittmar. Uh, Mary Lynn and I co-chair a uh, subcommittee on the, uh, the uh, Space Council User Advisory Group. So uh, we've been able to accomplish a lot on that committee as well. So really looking forward to this. And thank you so much for, uh, for allowing me to have me again for a second term. Thank you, Eric. Next up, we have Miss Ann Zokowski. Director of, Lock, Director of NASA programs at Lockheed Martin. And this is Anne's first uh, Comstack role as well. Anne. Thanks, Charity. Looking forward to working with you and Karina. And I'll be serving on the regulatory working group, working with Shanna and Clay. Uh, I, I work between Lockheed Martin's commercial civil space line of business in, that's headquartered in Denver, and then also our government affairs team that's uh, here in DC. So uh, I have been there for about five and a half years. And prior to that, I worked with a lot of you in my capacity in the Senate as the staff director for the Subcommittee on Science and Space. Uh, so had served for almost a decade in the Senate under Inouye, Rockefeller, and Nelson were the members that I served on both the science and space capacity. So have addressed a lot of these things legislatively and now work with them from an industry perspective. So. Look forward to bringing that, uh, those two parts of my background to bear with the conversations at Comstack. So really happy to be part of the group. Thank you, Ann. I'd like to circle back to General Jim Armour. Jim, are you on? Yes, I am. Can you hear Great. me on okay, Charity? I, I hear you loud and clear. Over Great. to you. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back uh, on another term of the Comstack. Um, I work as a, as a director of government relations at Northrop Grumman, and there my focus is on US government policy regulations and license, licensing that affect all of our commercial business cases, uh, in particular communication satellites on orbit servicing and launch. Um, most recently, I've been working on licensing for our first on orbit servicing system, the MEV-1. A lot of you may have seen that in the press. And I am the first industry chairman of, of the On Orbit Servicing Industry Association, CONFERS, where actually I work with charity a lot. Uh, um, prior to my uh, 12 years in industry, I was 34 years in the Air Force, almost all of which was in space operations and acquisition, including as a shuttle payload specialist, GPS director, and a SIGINT director at the National Reconnaissance Office. I retired as the director of the National Security Space Office, where I worked with a couple of us, uh, Paul and Eric, uh, in the group here as well. I've been with Comstack since uh, about 2017, and I'm really pleased Secretary Chow invited me to extend for another term where I can support um, FAA AST's rollout of these precedent-setting streamlined launch and re-entry in spaceport rules, and I'm looking forward to working with everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Thank you Jim. 
And Mike Moses, is President Virgin Galactic. Mike, are you on? Yeah, Chair Gimon, can you hear Great. me now? Yes. Great. So let's see. Yeah, I joined Virgin Galactic uh, a little more than eight years ago, back in 2011, when the uh, space shuttle program ended. I was a uh, 17 years at NASA in the space shuttle program as a flight director and launch integration manager. Actually, uh, seeing Steve Lindsay on earlier reminded me I had the pleasure of uh, leading the team that launched him on one of the final shuttle missions. So after that, I came to Virgin and, and we've been setting up space flight operations uh, ever since. I'm looking forward uh, to the area that we talked about at the beginning of, of starting human uh, space flight and, and helping the FAA and Comstack with the uh, safety committee and the regulations that we'll be putting together to look how we uh, deal with human space flight safety. Uh, so looking forward to this year, thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so uh, General Monteith, as you can see, we have a wide range of expertise uh, here amongst uh, the Comstack uh, from launch to regulatory experts experience, including those who have actually been in space, uh, those that have served in government, and many veterans as well. Uh, this broad range will help bring uh, fresh ideas and perspective to the issues at hand. But first, I'd like to ask Jim if he would uh, go forward and, and let us know about some, some of the updates at FAAST that we've been uh, waiting on. Jim. Thanks, Janice. Absolutely. Uh... Thank you, Charity, and welcome to all the Comstec members. Uh, it's a great team and look forward to working with you and hearing the results uh, and helping the FAA uh, move this industry forward. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Wayne Monteith again, the Associate Administrator for the Commercial Space Transportation uh, and have him give us an update, uh, give Comstec an update on the organizational change uh, here that's taken place recently at AST. Mr. Monteith. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Jim. <clears throat> and, uh, are we up? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, thanks again, Jim. Um, I wanna talk to you just a little bit about uh, our reorganization. Uh, then I'm gonna turn it over to our new executive director uh, for operational safety, Lirio Olu, and, and then our, our uh, new director of spaceports, uh, Pam Underwood, for updates as well. Uh, you know, you've heard you've heard, uh, you've heard uh, a lot about our reorganization since the uh, secretary announced it uh, over a year ago uh, while she was visiting Kennedy Space Center. Uh, and we, we affectionately refer to it as the biggest little reorganization in the FAA. Uh, it's amazing uh, uh, how much people are interested in this, and, and it goes to show you uh, how concerned folks are with, with helping us get this right to include the secretary and the administrator. It was not lost on her that no matter how effective an organization that you have uh, and how well it's running, uh, if you see a tremendous change in the industry, in our case, in the industry that we regulate, then something has got to give. Uh, and for us, you know, in 2012, I think we had three launches uh, and, and now we're looking into the 30s. And so you've got that kind of increase in cadence with only a 40% increase in personnel. Again, something, something has to give. And, and as part of this reorganization uh, of the office, we really focused on, on four things. And that's ensuring that we have the right people. Uh, I talked about that a little earlier. Uh, the right numbers of people to go along with the right skill sets of people. I know we're short in both, particularly as we move forward to keep up with the cadence and complexity of this uh, dynamic industry. Uh, we've got to have a flexible regulatory construct, uh, which we're working on with SLR2 uh, or Part 450. We've absolutely got to have the right processes. I've talked about that a little bit. We brought in uh, outside teams to help us uh, uh, look at all of our internal processes to see what we need to do to be able to take maximum advantage of the flexibility that SLR2 is, is uh, going to provide us. And then finally, you have to have the right organizational structure to take care or take advantage of all of what I previously mentioned. And so when, we, when the secretary looked at this and I sat down and talked with her over a year ago, uh, we realized it, uh, that, that a change needed to be made for uh, efficiency, effectiveness, uh, accountability, quite frankly, 
but also scalability uh, and to ensure our re relevancy for the future. You know, I, I alluded to it earlier that you know you can't increase your workload by ten times, uh, and then uh, only increase your workforce by forty percent and expect to be successful. Uh, so, how have we changed? Uh, primarily, we have reorganized under a functional construct, and so now rather than having, let's say, the licensing process spread across multiple divisions, uh, it's all going to be under one. Uh, a manager that's going to be responsible from cradle to grave. Uh, but more importantly than that, we now have our two executives are directly responsible for production, I'll call it. Uh, heretofore, they were, they were doing uh, the executive positions were set up to take care of other functions, uh, kind of support functions uh, in the office. Now they are directly related to the success, not only the office, but more important, the success of the space transportation industry. Uh, we're also, we've, we've realigned folks to, to where they should be working so that we can uh, take advantage of the synergies between uh, or, or in, in these teams and then across teams. So we're actually, we're, while we're not physically moving people, we're structurally moving people. Uh, this construct now allows for a streamlined process. And I'll, I'll show you the org chart. Uh, it'll be a little anticlimactic to you. Um, but as our mission needs grow, the organization can, can grow naturally uh, as well. Even if we pick up new uh, functionality, uh, the way we've set this up now is sort of plug and play. Uh, if I get up next slide, please. Okay, all of this is built on uh, that safety foundation. Uh, but, you know, we're going from an organization that's uh, currently, we sit at about 96 people. Uh, we've got six more inbound right now. Uh, we've got firm offers out for another four. So we're growing the organization uh, at 10 to 20%. Uh, and so that will allow us to handle uh, the foundation of handling the rapid growth and the companies that we're seeing, the rapid growth and technologies that we're seeing. But this is all based on, A, keeping our perfect safety record, uh, but also uh, ensuring that we do our part to make sure that the U.S. remains the global leader in this uh, sector. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, it's, again, it's all based on safety, because without safety, there is no business. You know, we do, most of you know, we, uh, uh, we're responsible for collision avoidance as you fly into space. Uh, the way I look at it, it's an on-ramp. Uh, for those of you from the National Capital Reason Region, it's on-ramping onto the Beltway. If we can't help you get onto the Beltway, uh, there is no business. Uh, if we can't safely get on, you onto the Beltway, you plug up the Beltway. So we take those roles exceptionally seriously, and this reorganization is part of that. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is kind of the, the, uh, the great unveil of the biggest little reorganization. Uh, if you were to see a previous org chart, it might not look a whole, dip, whole lot different. Uh, but what this really focuses on, again, is functionality, right people in the right jobs, and executives uh, that have the authority and the responsibility to make things happen. So, so we're starting on, on the, uh, the left of my chart, uh, organizational safety director that is run by Lirio Lu. Uh, it was a coup to get her to be able to join our team. Uh, long time uh, FAA employee uh, executive. Uh, tremendous, tremendous skills that she brings to the team. Not the least of which is she used to run the FAA's Office of Rulemaking. Uh, so that was like a double Scooby bonus uh, in her skill set when we brought her onto the team because she's made a huge difference, not only in the operational side, but also in the, the progress we've been able to make on the rule. We now have three uh, standalone divisions under her. Uh, safety authorization, that is all of our licensing, everything. Uh, Pre-application, letters of agreement, permits, all of that now falls under Dan Murray. Safety analysis division, all of our safety will be done, flight safety, system safety, ground safety, uh, that's all being done under Randy Repcheck and our safety assurance division, which will do all our inspection, oversight, compliance. 
Uh, we brought in uh, retired Colonel Steve Lang uh, to join us. Uh, Steve and I had the, the uh, or I had the great pleasure of working with Steve at the 45th Space Wing, uh, where he started out as my uh, launch group commander and transitioned to the operations group command role. Uh, Steve brings tremendous practical and operational experience to our endeavor as we shift from a, uh, an inspection process that sometimes was more gotcha uh, to a more of a learning organization uh, that will focus more on compliance and helping the entire system get better, not only our stakeholders, but more importantly, uh, AST. Uh, we also have Dr. Paul Wild uh, is assuming a new role as senior technical advisor. Uh, you may have previously heard him referred to as the chief engineer. Um, we have shifted the title of his responsibilities because it makes it more expansive, number one. But number two, even more importantly for me, it now aligns us with the similar functions across the FAA. You know, I started out my remarks this morning with, you know, the, the uh, Netflix show Space, uh, Space Force, space is hard. Uh, that doesn't mean space has to be different. And so we are working very hard to, to take those things in the FAA that are transferable over us. Uh, and that's, that is one small step in that. Moving to the other side, uh, Jim Hatt is currently our acting executive on our st strategic management directorate. Uh, and that's all the things that allow us to move forward. Uh, it's our budget, it's our finance, it's our personnel, uh, things like Comstack, rulemaking, uh, interagency coordination, inter international coordination, stakeholder outreach, all of those things that will help us become successful and quite frankly, be able to allow us to remain uh, not only relevant, but agile enough to keep up with this dynamic industry. And then the final thing I'll point out is Congress directed us to stand up an office of spaceports. Uh, and as we looked at this reorganization, I couldn't have found a better person than Pam Underwood to take the responsibility for this, uh, for building this new office uh, and do the, the, the support that is necessary to our current spaceports and the spaceports that, that we will be bringing online in the future. So Pam brings tremendous, tremendous uh, experience to this role. And quite frankly, I'm already seeing uh, uh, geometric growth in our ability to support the spaceports. Uh, so that was really all I had. Uh, bottom line, we are, we are uh, engaging even more with the stakeholder community. We are looking every single week how we can get better. Uh, I look for your feedback or your continued feedback on, on how we can get better. But again, all of this is to allow us uh, to move at the speed of business uh, and to get out of some of the, the uh, uh, bureaucratic holes we have found ourselves in. Because unfortunately, we are not going to increase the size of our office by 100, 200, 300, 500 uh, percent to keep pace with the, uh, the rate that our workload is changing. So to the Comstack members, uh, you are an integral part of helping us move forward uh, and also uh, helping us uh, become that 21st century uh, regulatory agency that enables continued U.S. global leadership in this transportation sector. Uh, thanks again. And uh, I look forward to the, the rest of the session. Jim, back over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to invite Ms. Lirio Liu uh, to speak. Uh, she is the Executive Director, Office of Safety Operations, Office of Commercial Space Transportation, the FAA. Uh, and she'll provide an update on the Part 450 <clears throat> rulemaking activities and where we stand currently. Ma'am. All right, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me well. First off, um, glad to be a part of AST. It has been six months and it's been certainly educational spaces. As they say, it's interesting. Uh, not necessarily hard, but it is, it's, it's not hard. It is hard, but it's not different. And I've been enjoying the opportunity to bring my experience from the other parts of the FA here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the rulemaking and it'll be uh, probably a background for most of you that have already been involved, but I know that some of the members of CONSPAC have not necessarily seen the historics on what has been going on with the rulemaking, so I just thought we'd go to the basics. Um, so everyone knows the National Space Policy was, policy was released uh, in May of 2018, 
and there were some very uh, direct focuses. Uh, one of them was get it to a single license for all types of the commercial space flights, um, replace the prescriptive requirements with performance space. And I think when you look at that, uh, we had a, a range of prescriptive and performance in the regulatory frameworks. Um, and then uh, also to coordinate with DOD and NASA to minimize the requirements that would conflict with our, um, our, our DOT requirements. So um, of those three main goals, we'll go to the next slide uh, if we can. Uh, we actually ended up trying to incorporate, well, I shouldn't say trying, we're in the, in the midst of finalizing it. Um, we took four parts um, and now having combined them into the new part 450. So the MPRM, published in March of 2019 on the FA website. It was during the furlough. So we continued to work through that process even during the furlough last year. <clears throat> on April 15th, it actually published in the Federal Register and we had put in a 60 day comment period. About six weeks later, we um, extended the comment period for another six weeks. And then um, based on industry's interests and also um, what we were seeing as activity related to the proposal, uh, we put in two letters to the docket, and the two letters specifically um, first indicated that we would um, request questions for clarification related to the proposed rule, which we would try to address, and also announced that we would take uh, personal meetings with certain industry stakeholders to gather concerns and assure that we were um, cognizant of those as we were addressing the comments. So if we can go to the next slide, please. One thing that was not noted in the first slide when the national space policy uh, was issued did say we would publish the final, the MPRM in the time frame that we did um, in uh, 2019. And that uh, the second point was, is that we would finalize the rule um, within a year. So uh, what we tried to do is, as we were extending the comment period and meeting with industry was making sure we were really cognizant of what the stakeholder issues were um, so that we could try to arrive at um, the final rule that would meet the intent of industry and the goals um, in the time frame that we had, which was very tight. Um, so in the July and August time frame, we actually ended up putting um, two, three batches of comments uh, clarifying to the issues we'd heard over the meetings, as well as um, the questions that were provided to us. And those are placed in the docket. So those are available for public um, um, consumption, if you'd like. Um, on July 22nd, we extended the comment period again for 20 days. So we ended up with, um, over a 120 day period for comments, which I think in some senses is a benefit to um, allow industry to fully review the MPRM that was proposed. But one thing it does do is it puts us at a, and being on the rulemaking side, um, uh, Mr. Monteith had heard that it was gonna be a challenge for us to finalize it with the, the limited time that we had. So in the end we did, uh, we have right now, final rule anticipated for publication in fall of 2020. So this is where we are right now. We can go to the next slide. What we saw in the comments, we had 154 total submittals. Five of them were really substantive. Um, and then we had other requests um, for a comment period extension, convening the art, et cetera, et cetera, you can see. And so this is just a summary of how the comments broke down. I, I think those are all available on the docket so you can look at it. Um, there were a range of, of areas that we bucketed them in, which is typically how we do comment analysis. And, um, and for the most part, we've been able to go through those. And I think uh, as Wayne has indicated, as well as, as Mr. Uh, Dixon, we um, and, and me coming in from being on the other side and now working in the policy office uh, addressing those issues, I feel that we have really taken the um, NPRM from um, the comment input and revised it so that it is a, a, a pretty functional rule. Um, we still have work to do. Um, we are getting uh, closer to getting it transmitted to OST in full. We've actually been working with um, what we would call as the executive review has started. Um, when it's an executive coordination, it's usually the uh, 45 days at the OST, uh, the Office of Transportation, and then also there's a 90 day requirement for significant rules over at OMB. So uh, if we're gonna meet the September timeframe, we're gonna be having the rule submitted to OMB um, in the July uh, timeframe is where we're really working towards. So we've had a lot of cooperation across um, OST and OMB in working on um, various means to do the coordination because it is a large document and it's technically complicated. Um, but we've had really good response as we've been working through it um, in phases uh, uh, with OST right now. So we've already transmitted uh, some portions of those and we're still working on uh, finalizing other activities. What's not mentioned here on the slides though is uh, we are also working on a number of advisory circulars which is, um, as it's been noted, is, 
in recent publications um, of DOT policy for rulemaking, um, our advisory circulars will also require some review um, and we intend to publish them for comments as well. So uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. I'm really proud of the team. Um, again, being new to, to AST, it's some, some magnificent people that work here. They do great work. Um, they are technically competent and they've got the right attitude to wanna make things work. Um, this was a challenging task, but I would say uh, I am pretty impressed uh, of where we've come from when I had published the MPRM to where we are now in the final rule. I see that it has extensively changed so that it actually is reflective of comments and I think allows us to do um, the intent of the national space policy. So with that, I think that is my last slide. Yes, thank you, Lirio. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to ask Pam Underwood, uh, the director of the Office of Spaceports uh, in the Office of Strategic Management to uh, come on and talk about the new office and her role within that office. Uh, it was established as we've heard in 2018 in the reauthorization bill. Pam? Thank you, Jim, and good morning, everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, it's been the first time I've attended a Comstack meeting virtually, so kudos to the team for making this happen. Um, I'm glad we're still able to meet even amidst all these times, and I hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy. So I had the opportunity this morning to talk about the Office of Spaceports, like Jim just mentioned. Um, we uh, have reorganized as Wayne mentioned and this first slide here shows where Office of Spaceport sits on the side of the uh, Office of Strategic Management in that directorate and where we sit. Um, it's an interesting opportunity. Um, I've, as many of you know, I've been with Office of Commercial Space Transportation for gosh a little over 14 years now, I've served in a lot of different capacities. So this is a new challenge for me. Um, and what I wanted to do this morning is just talk a little bit about the office because it is new. Um, and kind of give you guys some ideas and, and some mission, vision, initial focus areas that we'll be looking at. Next slide, please. So as Jim mentioned, the uh, Office of Spaceports, and as many of you probably know, was uh, directed to be stood up in the 2018 FAA Reauthorization Act. And from that act in Chapter 515, it did identify certain functions that this office was supposed to do. They're listed here on this chart. Support licensing activities. Uh, it's important to note that licensing is still taking place under ASA 100, as um, Wayne mentioned, under Dan Murray and Lyria's organization. But Office of Space Sports is supposed to help enable that. Um, we're also supposed to be developing policies that will promote infrastructure improvements, provide technical assistance, promote spaceports within the department, and of course, strengthen the national competitiveness uh, within the infrastructure for commercial space transportation. Next chart, please. Since this is a new office, I thought I'd start with the basics here this morning for the ComStat group and just talk about what the mission and vision for this office is. The mission is to enable the safest, most efficient network of launch and reentry spaceports in the world. In the vision, we want to advance a robust and innovative national system of spaceports befitting the U.S. as a global leader in the commercial space transportation industry. It's important that we uh, take advantage of the infrastructure that we have and try to make that um, ready for the needs of the commercial space transportation industry going forward. Next chart, please. Some of the strategic goals that we have for this office. Uh, first, we want to strengthen the competitiveness of launch and reentry infrastructure and services that support the U.S. commercial space transportation industry. We want to do this and encourage innovation and strategic partnerships for future spaceport planning and developing. That's going to be really key moving forward to try to strengthen the infrastructure that we have. And again, like I previously said, make sure that infrastructure and services are prepared to meet the needs of the commercial space transportation industry going forward. The second strategic goal is we want to modernize the regulation of U.S. launch and reentry sites, promoting increased public safety for the growing commercial space transportation industry. Um, the regulations that we have have been working, but what we want to do is take a look at is that what we need moving forward in the future for our spaceport, um, for domestic spaceports. 
The third uh, strategic goal for the office is we want to collaborate with countries that are developing launch and reentry sites and promulgate U.S. commercial space transportation regulations. We have commercial space transportation regulations and have been launching for many years, as has been discussed on this uh, conference so far this morning. There's, what we're seeing is a lot of countries are now developing launch sites and want to host uh, launch activities from their location. I think that's a great thing for our industry. Going global is, is a good thing that we can all take advantage of. What we want to do is try to promote um, how those are regulated, best practices within safety, and try to develop partnerships that are going to be really key to making sure that's successful in the future. Next slide, please. So from those strategic goals and mission vision, these are some of the focus areas that we have initially for the Office of Space Force. The first one is we're working with the U.S. Space Force in their transition of the Eastern and Western Ranges. We want to make sure that we are working with um, the various stakeholders and bringing in industry, again, to meet the needs for the growing industry and see what we can do to make those ranges be more efficient for both government and commercial companies. We want to develop an internal plan for a DOT slash FAA spaceport infrastructure grant program. Of course, that's going to be pending congressional appropriations, but it's important for us as Office of Spaceport to make sure that we're ready and have a plan together to facilitate and implement that as it is funded. The next thing we want to do as an initial focus area in the Office of Space Force is we want to coordinate U.S. commercial space transportation regulations with countries that are developing launch reentry sites. I mentioned this before in the strategic goals. What we'd like to do is preclude duplicative licensing efforts and support the U.S. as a global leader in space transportation. As I previously mentioned, the United States has got a great deal of experience with this, best practices, um, we have new regulations that Lirio just mentioned we are working on and looking at publishing, and that experience is really beneficial to other countries as they're looking to develop and, and encourage the growth of commercial space in their areas. So it's important for the United States to maintain these partnerships and help these countries, especially where there's U.S. interest involved. Many U.S. companies are looking to use some of these international launch sites, and what we want to do is make sure that we set up an environment that has a stable, safe operating environment, regardless where they're launching from. Uh, another initial focus area is, again, consistent with our strategic goals I just mentioned. We want to modernize the regulation of U.S. launch and reentry sites, taking a look at our current Part 420 and Part 433 regulations and seeing what we need to do um, for potentially future rulemaking or policy developments in the future. And finally, it, it definitely goes without saying, but it's important. We want to promote the capabilities and needs of our nation's spaceports. That's really critical. Um, infrastructure improvements are going to need, be needed as we go forward to maintain um, the pace of the industry. They're continuing to innovate, and our spaceports need to do the same thing. So what we want to do is promote the needs and capabilities of those um, spaceports as we go forward to make sure that we do, in fact, preserve what our industry needs to continue growing and prospering. It's a very exciting time. And Space Force, in recognition of their um, position in supporting that, is really key and critical for the Office of Space Force. Next slide, please. I appreciate the time um, and being able to address everybody this morning and hand it back over to you, Jim. Thank you very much. All right, thank you and uh, Comstack uh, committee. Uh, this is the updates um, you'd ask for. So Charity, I'll turn it back over to you um, to proceed. Thank you. And thank you, Pam and Lirio. Thanks, Jim. Um, as was alluded to in some of the introductions this morning, we have three working groups uh, to deal with some pressing uh, uh, initiatives uh, of the FAA to get some industry insight into. The first working group is a regulatory working group. A second one is the safety working group. And the third is an innovation and in infrastructure working group. Uh, and it's my honor to introduce the chairs and the co-chairs of those three working groups. And then we'll go through some priorities uh, for each of those uh, working groups. For the regulatory working group, 
uh, the chair is Shanna Dale and co-chair is Clay Mowry. For the safety working group, the chair is Greg Autry and co-chair Ravi Sabatier. And innovation and infrastructure working group, chair is Paul Dampos and co-chair is Lee Rosen. So Jim, uh, I'd like to ask you if you could run through those tasks and priorities of the FAA that you'd like the ComStat membership to tackle. Thank you. Absolutely, Charity. Thank you. So next slide, please. For the safety working group, and instead of reading through the slides, I'll give just a little bit more background to these tasks. Uh, but I think you can see the tasks and, and everybody out there looking in or in live stream uh, can see these tasks. The first one, preparing for human space flight, updates to the section 111 of the Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act. Uh, as everybody's mentioned, and every, I think everybody knows, uh, companies are beginning to fly humans into space. However, uh, FAA is currently prohibited by law from promulgating regulations on human spaceflight industry. Uh, the industry has the opportunity to create human spaceflight best practices that FAA may use to create regulation when that moratorium on human spaceflight regulation is lifted. Additionally, the 2015 Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act, or CSLCA, directed the Secretary of Transportation in consultation and coordination with Comstack to submit regular reports indicating the readiness of the commercial space industry to transition to a regulatory excuse me, framework for commercial human spaceflight. So that's the, the genesis of this task um, to, to get that information from Comstack and be able not only to report back to Congress, but have a good basis uh, for future actions. Next slide. All right, on the regulatory working group, they have multiple tasks that we've asked. And the, the first one, is prioritizing future rulemaking, pretty self-evident. We have several rules out there, um, all of which are definitely due to be reworked. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the bandwidth to redo all the rules all at the same time. Uh, if you're involved in the current Part 450, uh, you, you definitely understand that this is a pretty momentous uh, lift. So we're asking Comstack to work with industry to figure out what the priority is for the industry so that we have a better understanding of the rationale for the priority that industry would like to see on our future rulemaking. Then task two, define a complete application. Again, a lot of words there on the screen. Uh, part 413.5 requires an applicant to Consult with the FAA before submitting an application to assess the application process and possible issues relevant to the FAA's licensing or permitting decision. This is a pre-application. Uh, part part 413.11 states the FAA will screen an application to determine whether it's complete enough for the FAA to start its review. If the FAA determines the application is complete enough, it will accept the application and begin the evaluation. The FAA's acceptance of an application, again, quoting from that rule, uh, the FAA acceptance of an application does not mean it has determined that the application is complete. Uh, so furthermore, it obligates an applicant to continue to submit information as required by the FAA uh, during the evaluation period. This lack of clarity over what is complete enough application causes some uncertainty uh, and a little tension. But having a better definition of complete enough will ameliorate this uncertainty and tension and improve the evaluation efficiency and hopefully shorten pre-application consultation. So that's a task two. Next slide. Three, international dual licensing. Um, Pam talked about this just a bit as uh, we move and have US launches uh, from other countries. 
and those other countries that host U.S. vehicles have or will have in the near future their own laws and regulations that must be complied with as those countries develop and phase in domestic regulations and techno technology and technical oversight capabilities. This creates a potential for duplication in dual licensing with the FAA that may result in additional burden on the industry as well as potential conflicting requirements. At the same time, AST funding for travel uh, outside the United States for inspections may be limited for launches and reentries. The 2014 National Space Transportation Policy directs the Secretary of Transportation and other appropriate agencies to advocate internationally for the adoption of United States government safety regulations, standards, and licensing measures to enhance global interoperability and safety of international commercial space transportation activities. This task will enable the FAA to evaluate issues in dual licensing as US companies choose to launch and or re-enter outside of the United States. Next slide. So for the Innovation and Infrastructure Working Group, there are again a few tasks. The first FAA Office of Spaceports. The Reauthorization Act of 2018 defined several functions for the Office of Spaceports. The act also instructed FAA to support spaceport licensing and provide technical assistance to spaceports. Two functions that are well understood and currently are underway. However, the FAA seeks Comstack's input on the develop, promote, and strengthen functions as addressed in the Reauthorization Act. So a, a few additional questions kind of delving into this. What policies might the FAA develop to promote infrastructure improvements at spaceports? Would these policies involve additional taxpayer funding? Are there any policies in existence today that impede infrastructure development at spaceports? What can the FAA do to improve competitiveness and resilience while maintaining public safety? So a few of those questions for that first task. The second task, the National Spaceport Authority. The Department of the Air Force is exploring the possibility of converting the Eastern and Western ranges into quasi-governmental entities similar to a civilian port authority. FAA seeks ComSec's input on this idea. How might a National Spaceport Authority focused exclusively on the Eastern and Western ranges affect the commercial space transportation industry? What are the benefits and disadvantages of this concept? What characteristics should such an entity have in order to maintain safety and facilitate the growth of the commercial space transportation industry? And then next slide. Research and development program. AST uh, does have a research and development program. We're transitioning uh, to something uh, slightly different uh, we think, and that's where we need Comstack's help. We would like Comstack to review the three program components, the internal administration, including programmatic management, technical management, and financial oversight. Number two, the acquisition structure, including types of acquisition instruments used for different types of research and the governance structures of those instruments in the conduct of research. And then third, the strategic management, including the commercial space transportation research thematic structure, the goals of our R&D themes, and the sequencing of significant milestones to achieve those goals. Next slide. And then this task is a com combination task uh, given both to the regulatory and the innovation and infrastructure working group. Uh, and this is spaceport regulatory reform. In the past five years or so, uh, FAA 
has evaluated several launch and reentry site applications. Some have been challenging due to, in part anyway, inadequate or unclear regulatory language in Part 420, license to operate a launch site, and Part 433, license to operate a reentry site. We're looking for a fresh look from the industry on how best to approach the regulation of launch and reentry sites, or if in fact they should be regulated at all by the FAA. The deliverable should include proposed regulatory language changes and describe the process by which Comstack gathered input and crafted those uh, recommendations. Again, very broad uh, area, but I think very necessary uh, as we look forward to potentially many more spaceports because there's no definition yet or there's no real clear understanding of how many spaceports we need. So as we move forward, how should that licensing take place? And I believe as the last slide. All right, uh, Charity, those are the AST priorities. So back over to you. Thanks, thanks, Jim. Uh, these taskers are certainly highlighting the importance of getting ready for a safe and a fantastic future that Administrator Dixon mentioned by reducing uncertainty in licensing, preparing the landscape for human spaceflight safety, and supporting the infrastructure needed for commercial spaceflight. Uh, we look forward to hearing from the working group chairs on plans to move forward on these items, and we'll be doing that a little later. But I do see we are nicely ahead of schedule to allow a short break before our next speaker. Uh, that is the hallmark of a great Comstack meeting, by the way. Well done, everyone. Uh, I'd like to recommend maybe a 25 minute pause of this meeting ahead of our next scheduled item, remarks by Dr. Sp uh, Scott Pace. Jim? That, that sounds great. Um, okay. We'll do that, but I would ask everybody to um, be back and ready to start again in 20 minutes and then we'll make sure everything's good to go. Sounds great. See you Thank all you. in 20.
Okay, stop sharing. Too All much. right, thank you, everybody, and welcome back. And we do have Dr. Scott Pace. Uh, he assumed the office of the Executive Secretary of the National Space Council on July 13, 2017. Dr. Pace was formerly the Director of Space Policy Institute at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, where he is also a professor of the practice of international affairs. So we've invited him to come speak to Comstack this morning, and I believe we have him online. Dr. Pace, are you available? Hi, good morning. Uh, happy to be here. Good morning, sir. Okay. Um, uh, so I figured I would start with uh, some hopefully brief remarks, and then I'll take have some time for questions. So uh, I would start by uh, thanking uh, DOT and the FAA for the, a lot of hard work that's going into streamlining uh, uh, the launch regs. Um, uh, I understand and uh, seeing progress, so we look forward to the conclusion uh, this summer. Uh, that that deadline is uh, is still there, uh, but I think you're in, I think you're in good shape. Uh, the uh, the president's uh, you know as you know recently had an executive order titled encouraging international support for recovery and use of of space resources, uh, and so uh, this is an example that even during this really challenging time right now with the with the nation uh, struggling with the pandemic, uh, that we're still working on making progress on space policy, uh, both policy and, and regulation. Um, now, this particular policy, if I just take a moment to mention it, is it regards the recovery and reuse of space resources, and it's part of the larger process of making a stable and predictable investment environment for commercial space innovators and entrepreneurs. And it's also important for the long-term sustainability of human space exploration and development for the moon, Mars, and, and other destinations. And so this is a, a further development in implementing Space Policy Directive 1 on reinvigorating America's human space exploration program, which the President uh, underscored uh, our commitment to the 67 Outer Space Treaty uh, and at the time also adapting it to uh, deal with uh, new opportunities uh, that the commercial sector is presenting to us. Uh, so we are affirming that Congress's intent that Americans have the right to engage in commercial exploration, recovery, and use of resources in outer space applicable with international law. And uh, we believe the entire world will benefit from stable international practices, which will enable private citizens and companies to continue to expand the economic sphere of activity beyond the Earth. Now, based on uh, SPD-1, uh, we're looking for a sustainable program with commercial and international partners, and uh, this means in situ resource utilization, uh, because uh, the U.S. government alone won't be doing everything. We need an environment that supports private activities in IRSRU and other related services. So a lot of the work that uh, I think that DOT and FAA have been doing in commercial launch for many years it may seem, uh, you know, maybe separate from that particular question of resource utilization, but uh, it's actually not. That, there, that the creation of a lightly regulated uh, entrepreneurial space industry with supportive regulation that adapts to technology as it changes is really a model uh, for the rest of the world as they decide how they want to take advantage of space and how they want their own private sectors and commercial entities to participate. Um, so DOT, FAA has been a pioneer in commercial space industry for, for many, many years uh, in how uh, they do it. Of course, we know the technology and markets change rapidly, and so the, today's challenge, of course, is updating those regs and, and keep ensuring they're continually relevant. Um, but again, our larger policy of expanding sphere of economic activity is being based upon uh, the really steady and professional work that DOT FAA has been doing for decades. Now, uh, another example of uh, priority in moving forward, uh, even under difficult times, uh, of course, is the uh, it's been both the NASA uh, SpaceX uh, DM2 crewed launch, and also the Space Force's X-37B launch. Uh, so these are two ongoing uh, missions. Um, and we're obviously monitoring the missions uh, closely because uh, bringing the astronauts home safely and a successful test of reentry capabilities is also part of the program. Um, you know, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. It's been going on for, for a long time. Um, but um, uh, again, we're still continuing to put one foot in front of the other and, and making progress. 
Now, a topic that uh, has been a, an active area of interest to uh, the Space Council, uh, again, related to our private activities in space or greater activities in space, has been space traffic monitoring. Um, and we've been seeing the next steps uh, on ensuring uh, the Commerce Department's Office of Space Commerce is successful uh, in growing and maturing its, uh, its SAA operations uh, in, in cooperation with the Combined Services Ops Center at Vandenberg. Uh, actually, it's been a really terrific relationship. Uh, DOD has been very forthcoming and accommodating. Uh, Secretary of Commerce, of course, has been out there and uh, is uh, very aware on, on this new responsibility that the Commerce Department has. Uh, and again, this step is not just um, to uh, provide a, uh, a, a kind of a commercial window or a private sector uh, window on this activity. Uh, but we also view it as doing SSA operations in a new and different way. Um, they're looking to utilize commercially focused SAA data sources and operations. Uh, the Open Architecture Data Repository is going to have lots of different sources of data coming in. We're seeing companies that are providing this now, and we want to take advantage of that. Um, and so sometimes uh, one of the bigger uh, burdens you can have for existing operations is your installed base. Everyone knows what it's like having a uh, information processing system that's uh, large and in place and everybody's used to working with. Uh, sometimes it's easier to start over with the green field and, uh, and a new start uh, with new technology. And uh, that's what we're hoping the opportunity to have for SSA. So we'll have close cooperation between DOD and Commerce, uh, but how uh, commerce works uh, and uses its SAA data, uh, we think will be uh, hopefully more faster and more innovative and adaptable uh, than traditional government systems have been, which will continue to serve, but continue to serve in, in more traditional ways. Um, now, at this stage, uh, we're developing uh, commercially focused uh, space traffic management uh, norms of behavior, um, and we're trying to uh, uh, promote discussions uh, with private sector and other companies as they're uh, working on satellite servicing and uh, uh, these orbital debris cleanup operations. Uh, we don't really have a long history, of course, in these areas. So having norms of behavior um, that everybody can recognize uh, for how we're going to be living and working together up there is vitally important. And SSA information is crucial to all that. Uh, we're having discussions, uh, of course, with the FCC now on their further notice of proposed rulemaking uh, regarding orbital debris management um, and some of the issues in there, like maneuverability of satellites and requirements for that, uh, in turn embed assumptions about how well you know uh, what's going on and what might be a threat, and if you do a maneuver, that, that it won't create another problem. Uh, and so assumptions uh, about SSA capabilities going forward are vital uh, to decisions we make about orbital duty regulations. Now, I also wanted to, um, uh, of course, uh, I've been talking about doing all this work uh, in light of the, uh, the pandemic uh, that's going on. Uh, so I wanted to touch a little bit on coronavirus relief and recovery and what impact it's been having on the larger commercial space industry and supply chain. Uh, it's right now, it's still a bit too early to uh, tell what the impacts of uh, COVID-19 will be on the, uh, on the Artemis milestones. We're watching closely the, uh, the SLS green run uh, test uh, uh, getting back up to speed, and we're hoping that that will be uh, uh, completed soon um, in the next few months. And at this point, most NASA centers are, have been in telework mode, although we're, again, revisiting that as local conditions uh, apply. The, um, Mission operations, such as, of course, Space Station, have been, have been going on uninterrupted, um, but, uh, you know, we're still not operating uh, in any sort of uh, fully normal mode. Um, you know, here at the White House, we're getting back uh, to full staffing. Um, uh, we hope to be, I think, at uh, almost close to 100 percent, maybe not quite 100 percent by the, by the end of the month. Uh, so we're, we're adapting as District of Columbia rules. Uh, coming in, we're adapting to that. And again, NASA centers are also adapting to local conditions um, as uh, as they dictate. So uh, the NASA, DOD, and the IC and other agencies have been cooperating a lot on minimizing the, the effects of disruption to the space industrial base, everything from, uh, uh, of course, the you know, payroll protection program, but also accelerating payments 
on contracts, making sure cash flow uh, is moving. Uh, we've been mindful of particularly smaller entrepreneurial firms uh, that uh, don't have the same kind of resources uh, as other larger companies riding this out. Um, and so the interagency process has been really great at sharing data and emerging issues in the industrial base. Uh, and DOT FAA has been a big, uh, a big part of that because we watch our launch industry. And uh, we've been engaging regularly, uh, uh, led uh, a lot by DOD, but uh, with others on industry partners and trade associations, regular, regular phone calls and tag ups to understand how they're being impacted, how we can fix uh, local problems. And so we've really appreciated the open dialogue we've had with industry uh, to, uh, to mitigate the effects of, uh, of the shutdown and the pandemic. Um, I want to think one of the things I guess internally looking at uh, to go forward is paying attention to the industrial base at uh, some of the lower tiers, second and third tier suppliers, uh, uh, what the skilled labor is like there. In some cases, uh, surveys industrial base show we may be down to you know, only one or two key suppliers uh, of uh, some element of the supply chain. And so uh, if there's a disruption there, it can impact a prime. Uh, so sometimes the small and medium enterprises, I think, need uh, additional attention uh, than just the big guys uh, because, you know, we can have healthy primes, but if the suppliers are hurting at lower tiers, uh, we're not going to be geared for success. Um, as, um, uh, again, as we're going forward, uh, uh, we've got uh, a, a couple of, uh, of things that have been in the pipeline for a while after the uh, uh, the in situ, excuse me, after the uh, exploiting non-terrestrial resources uh, executive order. Um, uh, I was hoping to have a few things out to announce here, but I, I don't. Uh, so uh, all I can say is sort of stay tuned as uh, uh, we have a couple of other policy directives and announcements uh, uh, gearing up. And uh, as soon as we can get them cleared and out, uh, we look forward to sharing them with you. Uh, so let me pause right there and, and really just take uh, take questions from you all. Uh, thanks, Scott. This is Charity uh, Whedon. How are you today? Hey, Charity. <laughs> Great. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, space traffic um, coordination um, and, and uh, the Commerce Department and gearing up for better space situational awareness. But I'd, I'd like to get your take on the, you know, the rising commercial space transportation community um, now uh, being able to fly astronauts into space. How are you thinking of ensuring the safety of those astronauts through the congested orbits? Mm, okay, fair enough. Um, so when you do, um, analysis of uh, what are the most risky areas of flight. Of course, there's launch, re-entry, and on orbit. And uh, in terms of the probability numbers, you know, um, micrometeorite or, or debris damage is one of the areas of, uh, of high risk, you know, when you're on orbit. Uh, so trying to measure that environment obviously depends on altitude. Uh, we're paying, uh, as we're at the space station orbit or below, uh, this is one of the areas of intense research that uh, JSC, as you know, uh, does in terms of characterizing uh, the environment. Um, I think as we improve our, our SSA capabilities, um, the uh, air, as you know, the air bubbles around the satellites can be shrunk a bit. And so I think there had been a fear at one point that if we had so many objects up there and if we didn't have enough analysis about uh, where they were with enough certainty, that we could wind up precluding or constraining launch windows. Um, I haven't heard a lot about that lately, uh, mostly because I think people have gotten used to working through um, and improving uh, uh, the, the amount of closures that they might have to suffer with. Uh, so there's the making sure we can launch when we want to launch and that we know where objects are so we don't uh, do something dumb. Um, and then there's the uh, debris on orbit that are sometimes hard to see in characterizing the debris environment because that's a big part of the overall risk um, of astronauts uh, on orbit. Uh, so I would say that's just an area of research. I'd like to see probably just personally, probably more research in this area, not just by NASA, but by, uh, by others. Uh, so when we talk with our OSTP uh, colleagues about areas of future R&D, um, 
I think, uh, research on the orbital debris environment, uh, just as we do more research on the space weather environment, um, is something we'd like to see. I don't know where that necessarily needs to be done. Is that NSF sort of thing? Is it, you know, more, you know, NASA grant kind of thing? Um, not really sure. Um, but I know I'd like to see some more re independent research on that environment uh, to help make decisions about uh, orbital safety. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd also like to know if you believe we're getting closer or further away from the one-stop shop model for commercial space regulations that we, we've been talking about for a little while now. Yeah, um, I, think, I think we're getting toward um, a, a kind of a, a, a three-part shop. Um, I would say that uh, there's always going to be the, uh, I would say, say always because one never knows, but I would say I would assume there will continue to be uh, the 1934 uh, you know, Act and it will still have the FCC in charge of uh, spectrum issues and uh, that won't go away. Um, and that uh, within uh, DOT, uh, you'll see that FAA will have responsibility for anything that touches on Title 49 responsibilities for national airspace. So anything that goes up, anything that comes down uh, through the national airspace or in and around that area uh, is DOT's responsibility. And I think anything beyond that, uh, uh, I think the Commerce Department uh, is uh, the right place for thinking about uh, flexible authorizations going in the future. You know, this is the whole mission authorization discussion, as we've, uh, we've talked about. Um, so while I would like, in theory, to have everything in one shop, um, I think what we're seeing as, is a step toward that is more of a... Um, kind of a coalescence into at least three places uh, outside the atmosphere, inside the atmosphere, and uh, the RF environment. Great, thank you. Um, also, hearing that there is an update for the national space policy, how is commercial space flight, you know, figured in that uh, as a policy priority? Uh, well, it absolutely is. We have, um, uh, we've reached out to uh, all, all the agencies, as you know, uh, are involved, and we're just in the middle of that process now. Uh, as, as you, we're primarily looking at deltas and adjustments to the uh, to the 2010 policy. Um, you know, as you know, we made immediate adjustments on the exploration direction uh, within the 2010 policy uh, uh, soon after the Space Council was stood up, um, but a lot of the rest of it. Uh, as, as you've heard me say before, is largely fine. Uh, there are new issues that we, we have to address. We are addressing them. Uh, DOT is a, is a full participant in it. Uh, we've sent uh, uh, a, a demarche or cable out to post uh, to other countries uh, to ask them what parts of the policy relating specifically to cooperation, not, not space transportation, but international cooperation per se, that they find particularly helpful or areas for improvement. Um, and so we're looking to, uh, in consulting with industry, uh, we're looking to the departments and agencies like Commerce and Transportation to uh, reach out uh, to their stakeholders uh, and bring their concerns uh, back in. Um, so I would say, yes, it's there. Uh, DOT has its responsibility in space transportation uh, to bring issues to the table. And uh, we've also made sure separately through state to touch base with our, our international colleagues. Scott, can I ask a question? Please, go for it. Um, you mentioned the issues that uh, some of the uh, small and medium-sized companies are facing. It's an area that I'm particularly engaged in and I see this. Um, this is an opportunity for a typical consolidation that might happen during uh, a recession or, or changes in private investment. Some of those investments are domestic and that's great. And, and some of the potential investors are international uh, investors that uh, could bring uh, capital to the US that uh, we'd probably be eager to have. Uh, in some cases though, it may not be clear who's actually investing or, or we may have uh, investments from uh, aggressor states we'd probably rather not have in the commercial space industry and I'm wondering what what your thoughts are along that line and and, and what the sure. 
White sure. House and government are doing to uh, to address that sure. concern. Sure. Uh, you know, so first of all, as a general matter, you know, we welcome international investment that produces jobs and and businesses, you know, in the United States. Uh, the case with Rocket Lab and uh, you know, in New Zealand, uh, the international uh, uh, funding that was available in, in Virgin Galactic and others. Um, you know, all that in general is a is a good thing. We want the U.S. to be the flag of choice in places where people come. Now, there are obvious limits uh, to that when, when you get toward uh, uh, states that don't have our necessarily our interests or have other interests in mind. And, and I'll be blunt, it's obviously it's China. And so China's commercial space industry uh, is growing. They're showing up in lots and lots of places, uh, not only in launch, but in remote sensing, communications, navigation as part of the Belt and Road initiatives and so forth. Uh, they have a major, major press on. Um, we've been concerned, or the concern has been raised, that uh, companies that might be vulnerable, uh, you know, during the during the downturn, during the, the pandemic, uh, could be vulnerable to being acquired or having an actual property picked up or uh, otherwise subject to, to, you know, hostile acquisitions, uh, you know, during this time. So we've been very alert to that. I have to say, I haven't seen many cases of it. I'm seeing more of Chinese competing uh, in lots of different areas. Um, but uh, uh, there, there have really only been a few cases where there looks to be, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a hostile, you know, sovereign wealth fund or state directed enterprise activity. And, um, you know, our CFIUS people have been picking that up uh, pretty routinely. So people are sensitive to it and uh, it's being picked up. Uh, but not a lot. It's again, somebody else may have deeper experience, but it's not been my impression. Uh, what I'm mostly seeing is uh, Chinese interest in expanding uh, and competing more in the market broadly, um, not necessarily just uh, picking up Western firms at a discount. Hi, Scott. Good morning. This is uh, Paul Danfus. Um, great, great to hear your voice again, and uh, congratulations on all your successes. Um, you know, a little bit, little bit off topic, but um, uh, you know, the administration has uh, a renewed emphasis, and hopefully this time to to stick on hypersonics. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding that uh, most of that uh, work is on the, the systems level, and and eventually uh, offensive and defensive systems, but uh, I was just wondering if you care to comment on looking over the horizon at potential point-to-point -point missions and and um, where the activities are going on with uh, with those potential future missions. Thank you. Copy that. Um, so obviously the vocal work going on in uh, in hypersonics has been in DoD. Uh, NASA is playing a strong role in in hypersonics, uh, you know, R and D and and supporting uh, sort of those uh, tests. Um, there are uh, uh, private sector firms that are also looking at supporting uh, you know, flight test uh, activities for, for DOD. Uh, so it's primarily been in hypersonic and weapons delivery kind of capacity. I know there's always the discussion about uh, you know point to point cargo and personal and passenger travel. Um, uh, maybe this is a, maybe a poor reflection on me, but I still see that as somewhat speculative. Uh, and somewhat over the horizon, I see us sort of working right now on trying to get the suborbital market up and running and, and sort of stabilized. I think people look forward to the possibility of point-to-point -point passenger and cargo travel. But right now, just getting a you know, routine suborbital access uh, to space and pushing hard on the unmanned uh, hypersonic and military applications is kind of really where the action is uh, with uh, uh, suborbital travel literally will build literally over the horizon a bit. Maybe it's not too soon to think about, uh, particularly for humans, um, because it takes a while to develop the standards and such. Um, but I still think that's a bit farther out uh, until I see how the, uh, uh, the initial market settles out. All right, Dr. Pace, thank you so much for taking the time this morning to share with Comstack. Uh, and also, additionally, uh, uh, 
for taking questions. We appreciate your time and your insights. Uh, and uh, with, with that last question, uh, we will, uh, again, say thank you and uh, let you continue on. Okay. Well, thanks much. Appreciate, uh, appreciate having, uh, letting me uh, uh, pop in on you. And uh, hopefully someday we'll get the technology where we can do this on video and not audio conference. But uh, White House Firewall is what it is, and uh, we haven't yet developed that capability. So that's something else we ought to be working on. So my apologies for just being a disembodied voice, but uh, uh, wish you all well for the day and uh, look forward to your results. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Take and care. Thanks. All right, Cherry, back over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Scott Pace for uh, taking some time out of his busy schedule uh, to talk to us today. Uh, next up, we are going to get into a report from the working groups on their progress to date. Uh, we gave you a brief introduction to the working group chairs and co-chairs, and now we want to let you know what progress we've made so far, what kind of uh, insights or information we've been gleaning or uh, subject matter experts we've been talking to and kind of the roadmap for accomplishing these eight tasks that were laid out before. First, I'd like to ask uh, Greg Autry uh, of the safety working group to give us uh, about a five to seven minute assessment of what they've been up to so far. Greg, over to you. Well, thank you, Charity. Uh, first of all, I'm Pleased to have uh, such a great working group. Uh, shout out to uh, my co-chair, uh, Robbie. Uh, excited to have uh, Marilyn Dittmar, uh, Chris Hassler, <clears throat> Steve Lindsay, and Mike Moses uh, on the team. We have a uh, bit of a unique challenge in that uh, our goal is to uh, look broadly at the issue of uh, occupant safety uh, standards in a situation where the Commercial Space Launch Act uh, in 2004, uh, Congress wisely prohibited or, or established a moratorium prohibiting uh, the regulation of, of occupant safety, which includes crew and uh, spaceflight participants. The reason for that was if the industry uh, hasn't established a dominant design or actually emerged from the, the nascent state to go in and, and regulate in uh, engineering standards or anything specific into an industry uh, is likely to both retard development of the industry and perhaps enshrine the uh, immature systems is, is a standard uh, and, and prevent a, a better understanding of what actually will, uh, will provide the best safety for these groups. So Congress again understood that. Uh, it's our job to go look and see what's evolving. And so consequently we've uh, asked everybody in the working group to go look through a list that uh, FAA kindly provided of uh, existing standards and proposals in development in places like uh, ASTM and uh, uh, AIAA, a uh, variety of different papers from a variety of different sources. We're gonna be spending the next month or two going through those, uh, reporting back to our working group and discussing where we think we find areas of, of consensus and, and agreement that uh, everybody can come together and say, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we'd all like to do that. Uh, this will be benefit to uh, the industry, to uh, FAA, to uh, the participants themselves as far as setting these voluntary uh, 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 informal guidelines. And it'll also queue up FAAST for when the day comes currently 2023 uh, that uh, they may choose to uh, implement some regulations along that line and certainly there are a variety of opinions there are many industries that have successfully self-regulated uh, similar activities as far as participant safety and there are other uh, circumstances where the government's found its role uh, to do that regulation. Robbie is there anything you would like to add to that? Hi, Greg. Uh, no, I think that was a good assessment of what we're doing and uh, it's just time to get to work now. Yeah, and we're looking forward to delivering something uh, 
uh, with real findings in the next meeting in September. So Charity, that's, uh, that's what we've got in safety. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, sorry for the delay there. It takes a little while for me to unmute and get my video back on. No, uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, gr great uh, start to the task at hand and, and definitely looking forward to um, some sort of report in the fall when we meet again. Uh, next up, we have Shanna Dale, the, the chair of the regulatory working group. Uh, Shanna, over to you on any updates you have on your uh, as I count, three, three and a half tasks uh, for the regulatory working group. Thank you. Thank you, Charity. Um, I can't, oh, okay, here, it, the box just came up to start my video. Thank you. So we have appointed leads for each task and are establishing processes for collaborative input from each working group member uh, later on, the Comstack members, AST, and also the public, other aerospace companies. So the first task I'm going to discuss is prioritizing future rulemaking. This is a task that Eric Stalmer from Commercial Space Flight Federation is leading with early input from Mike French of Aerospace Industries Association Mary Lynn Dittmar for the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, and Bill Beckman of Boeing. Uh, we do have a preliminary outline that has been provided by Eric, and we plan to distribute it to the working group later this week, and in a couple of weeks, uh, distribute it to the Comstack members for input. I will say that we are also very interested in seeking input from aerospace companies and consultants that may be affected by AST regulations but are not necessarily represented by any of the applicable trade groups. And we're still trying to work through how to get that done. Um, I wanna thank Greg Autry and also uh, Robbie Sabatier uh, for providing um, a list of companies and we're working through that list to make sure we're being as inclusive as possible. For the next public meeting of Comstack, we expect to have a well-scoped document for this particular task to present uh, to AST for a, a roadmap of future rulemaking priorities. The second task that I'm going to discuss is international dual licensing. This is a task that is being led by Mike French of AIA um, he's already prepared the outline, pretty comprehensive, and that has been distributed to the working group for input. Again, we plan to uh, deliver this to the broader Comstack membership in a couple of weeks for input as well. This is something that he's working closely with uh, Clay on in regards to outreach to affected companies and also um, have setting up some detailed discussions with AST to delve even deeper into some of the issues in this topic. For the next public meeting, we expect that we will have a progress report ready on this effort. And at this point, um, I would like to turn the mic back over so that uh, Clay Morey, uh, my co-chair, can uh, give an update on the other two tasks under our working group. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shanna. Charity, can you hear me? I can hear you, Clay. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, the first of those two tasks is the complete complete application, or I should say complete enough application. Uh, Jim did a nice job outlining the uh, the part uh, 413 sections 5.5.11 uh, and dot 13, uh, where we're trying to figure out how to actually define what a complete application looks like. And Zlokowski with uh, Lockheed is leading this effort with me. Uh, we've met already uh, with the folks at AST to get a review of the pre-application and application process 
uh, and we're uh, reviewing now and talking to other folks in the industry, uh, trying to pull in, as Shanna said, uh, uh, ideas uh, for what's going on here. Basically, the, the effort is looking at try to figure out how do we uh, look for process improvement, resource, and definitional improvements here for complete application. So it, the, the work so far is look, uh, it runs the, uh, the gamut from uh, developing lists of outside experts that could help companies, um, defining what those resources uh, uh, are gonna look like for the various applica applicants, uh, checklists and timelines, elements for what a model application could be, um, and looking for process transparency and, and understanding who in AST is involved in which aspects. Um, I think it was mentioned before having a single point of contact, but trying to figure out where in the licensing review process uh, uh, things can be done in parallel to try to streamline this process and drive to a, a defeat, uh, define a complete application. So uh, we're working to, uh, to, to pull all that in, uh, develop a, a complete list of what uh, the aspects of, of this issue is, and then to drive for a report in September with some preliminary recommendations back to the, the organization. So um, that's the, the complete application sector. The other one uh, is this uh, spaceport regulatory reform, which is also being worked with the INI group. Jim Armour is working uh, on that effort uh, from our working group on drafting an action plan to share with the group in the next few weeks. So this is the, um, uh, you know, evaluating under part 420 uh, and part 433. Uh, so working there again to reach out to stakeholders, identify best practices and propose some, some regulatory language revising uh, how, how this could be improved. So uh, we can expect more, uh, I think in uh, by September this year uh, for our next meeting. And I would just say beyond those efforts, um, we're inviting uh, folks uh, from the different industry organizations to see if there are other issues the regulatory working group could take on. Obviously this part 450 final Rule expected um, in September is a big uh, issue. A number of folks have mentioned that to us, but we're open to other issues that the regular work, regulatory working group could take on beyond these um, these taskers. Thanks. Great, thank you, Shanna and Clay. Uh, definitely um, getting a head start on on these issues. Next up, we have. Uh, the Innovation and Infrastructure Working Group uh, chairs Paul Damphouse, and he will give us an update on what they've been working through so far. Paul? Indeed. Thanks, Charity. Appreciate it. Um, so as you see on your screen, we've got a great, uh, a great team of folks on the, uh, on the I, I Working Group. Uh, Co-chair is Lee uh, from SpaceX, uh, Senator Carnes. Uh, Dale Ketchum from Space Florida, Dale Nash from Virginia Spaceport, and Sharon Pinkerton from Airlines for America. So um, we've been pretty active uh, prior to the full ComStack meeting. Uh, a few meetings just to get to know each other and kind of uh, lay out uh, what the next year is going to entail for us. Uh, so a lot of the things that we've been doing is just identifying coordinators for each topic, and that's the person who's just going to herd all the cats and, and start doing start coordinating some of the writing. Uh, we've developed work plans for all four of our topics. Uh, and we've been developing a robust list of subject matter experts and questions that we want to ask those SMEs uh, following the, uh, the full ComStack uh, meeting. So after the ComStack meeting, we've, uh, we've got a list of, again, those SMEs that we've uh, got uh, lined up for, for scheduled. We've got our first speaker on the uh, 8th of July, and that's a, um, a senior civilian from US Space Force who's gonna talk to us about uh, spaceport, uh, some spaceport uh, um, issues. Um, further, we're kind of extending out some invitations out to the community to get additional input, uh, engaging AST as, as needed and as appropriate and requesting the appropriate documentation that we need uh, to really get down in the weeds and start writing our, our topics. So what we see for the, and this is across the board for all of our topics, what we see for the next uh, several months through the summer, again, are those SME, SME brief, briefings and then synthesizing the input we get from those briefings <clears throat> into our uh, writing plans. We expect to start working on initial drafts of our documents, uh, some of which we've already made significant progress on. 
but we intend to have those, uh, those internal drafts done by the end of July. And then uh, going into August, we would be sharing a more formalized draft with the broader ComStack. Our intent is going into the fall meeting for a presentation of our draft uh, papers. And each of these will take the form of generally a white paper. Um, there'll be some, some preamble in there where we use the old uh, observations, finding and recommendations up front, but then we'll build it out into a uh, short white paper for each of these uh, each of these topics. In the fall meeting, we'll be soliciting additional uh, input from from our senior leaders, and then our intent is to present uh, the final documentation for the spring full Comstack meeting. Uh, so we do have a robust slate of of topics. Um, just a few notes on, on each one of those. Uh, National Spaceport Authority, that's the, the topic that we have our first speaker from U.S. Space Force scheduled on the 8th of July. Um, we would really love to see, and we've made the suggestion to um, invite General Raymond to an, uh, address the full comm stack in the, in the fall. I think that would be really great for a, a number of our, our topics. Um, we are also looking at uh, the AS, AST's R&D priorities, and that really makes up, uh, we're looking at three different aspects of that, the internal administration, acquisition structure, uh, strategic management. So for our initial draft, we'll be looking at each one of those and providing interim results individually for each of those topics. And then we'll synthesize uh, an integrated uh, paper for the, uh, for the final, integrating all three of those, those elements. Uh, for the Office of uh, Spaceports, again, there's going to be a lot of interaction with AST on, on this. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion that we're going to be having, and it's part of our topic is to look at the uh, space transportation infrastructure matching grants. That says we streamlined this topic a little bit. That became a highlight of this, uh, this topic, which is good because uh, Dale Nash and I have sort of have a head start on this from a previous uh, from the previous ComStack, where uh, on the uh, infrastructure working group, we we started to tackle this this topic. So this is something that's uh, that we do have a little bit of a uh, of a heads up on, um, or head start on rather. Uh, then the fourth topic is the one that um, the regulatory working group is working with us. Uh, that is a joint topic, and again, Part 450 is going to have a key role on this. We have a series of activities. Uh, prior to the publication of uh, Part 450, and then a series of activities that we're uh, going to be looking at um, post-publication of Part 450. So very robust uh, agenda and a uh, very busy summer for us, collecting information and starting to do uh, our writing in, in anticipation of the, uh, the fall uh, Comstack meeting. So we're really excited to tackle it. We've got a great, great team of folks, the best uh, folks to tackle this. Uh, these this suite of topics. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that summary. And thanks to all the working group chairs and co-chairs for uh, stepping in and uh, really leading the, the cause here and for all our members for um, getting, getting into the topics uh, right away and getting a, a good pace of effort um, moving along for some some uh, concrete results in the September Comstack meeting. Next up, we have uh, a section dedicated for public comments. Those that have uh, written in and wanted to uh, have the, uh, the opportunity to speak uh, to the, the membership here. And then there will be some other business. So uh, first up, however, um, we have uh, one a member of the public that would like to speak. And uh, I see that is George Neal. Um, George, if you're on, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself and please go ahead. Thank you. All right, thank you, Charity and members of the Comstack. I appreciate you allowing me to uh, speak with you today. My name is Dr. George Neal and I currently serve as the chairman of the Global Spaceport Alliance. Uh, the GSA was formed in 2015 with the goal of creating a global network of spaceports that will allow increased access to space and that can serve as focal points and technology hubs in growing the space economy. The group currently has 20 member spaceports from five different countries all over the world. We hold an annual spaceport summit in Houston in conjunction with the Spacecom conference. 
and we're actively involved in partnering with stakeholders at NASA, at the Department of Commerce, and the FAA, as well as with industry and academia. This is a very exciting time for commercial space, especially for those of us interested in spaceports. As you know, the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 contains several spaceport related provisions. In addition to mandating the establishment of the Office of Spaceports within the FAA, the act called for the preparation of two reports to Congress, one by the Secretary of Transportation on national spaceport policy and one by the GAO on potential options for funding spaceport infrastructure. Both reports were to be submitted to Congress within one year, which means they were due last October. Unfortunately, as a result of the lengthy review process, I don't believe that either report has so far been delivered. However, because both topics are so important, I think it's crucial that we continue our discussion of those issues. So that brings me to the primary reason for my comments today. I wanted to let the Comstack know that the Global Spaceport Alliance has just completed putting together a document called the National Spaceport Network Development Plan for the FAA Office of Spaceports and other interested stakeholders. Uh, the document contains a proposal for a national spaceport policy, potential benefits associated with the development of a national spaceport network consisting of current and prospective commercial spaceports, government owned and operated launch and landing sites and privately owned and operated launch and landing sites. Comments on the recent range of the future activities by the Department of Defense. A series of options for providing spaceport infrastructure funding. Some ideas for spaceport related programmatic initiatives and a series of recommendations on needed changes to policies, laws, and regulations. Also included is a list of specific spaceport infrastructure projects and related cost estimates. We expect to update the document annually or as conditions warrant. And in some ways it could be thought of as being the spaceport equivalent to the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems or NIPIUS that is published biannually by the FAA Office of Spaceports. So if Comstack members or other participants in the meeting today would like to find out more about the Global Spaceport Alliance or the National Spaceport Network Development Plan, please let me know and I'd be happy to provide a briefing at one of your future meetings or to engage with you individually, both to answer your questions and to discuss how we can make the document more useful as an information resource for the community. My email address is george.neild at commercialspacetechnologies.com. That's george.neild at commercialspacetechnologies.com. Once again, I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to working with the Comstack on these very important issues. Thank you, Dr. Neil. Uh, that sounds quite interesting and I would like to get a copy of that plan uh, if you would be kind to share it with us and we will certainly um, work with the Innovation Infrastructure Working Group to see if if we need a, a full briefing uh, from you but thanks a lot for that that comment. Uh, I understand there are no other public comments at this time so I'd like to propose that we uh, go forward for other business. Um, I'm gonna just take a couple of minutes to, to say a few remarks um, and then hand it over to Karina and, and then see if Jim has any final uh, comments for this meeting. Uh, first, I wanna reiterate my thanks to FAAST and to the Comstack members for your perspectives on the commercial space transportation com uh, community and to the chairs and co-chairs of the working groups for your energy and commitment. I also want to recognize the outgoing chair, Mike Gold, and vice chair, Mike, Michael lopez Allegra, and all the members of the previous Comstacks. Uh, Mike and Mike uh, were chair and vice chair since 2012. And during that time, their leadership really helped advance commercial space flight issues at a critical time of growth in the industry. 
and I, I realize I have big shoes to step into. Um, and I may not have Red Sox analogies uh, to throw in and keep the dialogue lively, but be forewarned, I did grow up in Edmonton in the 1980s. So there may be some Stanley Cup nostalgia that comes out from time to time. Uh, I wanted to go over for the Comstock members, the new members rather, um, some of the Comstock basics for the public and our new members. As mentioned before, this is the 36th year of Comstock. Uh, it was formed in 1984. And our recent charter was approved in June of last year. Within, it states that the objective of this committee is to provide information, advice, and recommendations to the Secretary of Transportation through FAA on all matters relating to US commercial space transportation industry activities. We are a forum for developing, considering, and communicating information from a knowledgeable independent perspective. We will meet approximately twice a year and serve a term of two years with a potential reappointment for a single successive term. The bylaws for the Comstock were also adopted last November, about six months ago. They go into more detail on the membership procedures, working groups, and culminating in a public forum like today to inform and if needed, deliberate and vote on matters. Now, both of these documents can be found on the FAA website if you would like to read them. This membership was selected in March, and so we now have less than two years to address, at a minimum, eight significant and pressing issues the FAA and U.S. commercial space transportation industry is facing. It's an aggressive task, but I know we are up for it. I'm also confident we have the expertise, leadership, and the focus to provide timely insights to address the slate of issues that cover regulatory safety and innovation and infrastructure needs of U.S. commercial space transportation. I, like many of you, watched as Doug and Bob launched from U.S. soil in a U.S. commercial spacecraft arriving safely aboard the International Space Station. It was a proud moment for both SpaceX and NASA, but also for the entire U.S. space community. My vision for this Comstack is simple, to see a safe, sustainable, and successful U.S. commercial space transportation industry today and into the future that is supported by modernized rules and regulation. This Comstack has the opportunity to play a role by having the foresight to see the challenges ahead and offer suggestions now, and to ensure that industry and government work hand in hand for safe and successful outcomes. In preparing for this meeting, I asked myself, what is the same as last time and what has changed? Well, there's several things that this Comstack group carries on. We have some different people, but the expertise here is still unmatched. I also feel we continue the same enthusiasm for this industry and commitment to see it thrive. And we are continuing to focus on preparing for the future. In this case, to ensure that regulatory updates are prioritized, the groundwork is laid for commercial spaceports, and that we set the scene for safety for a new wave of humans that will go into space. There are also things that make this Comstack different. As you might have picked up on, our outputs will look slightly different. We'll still have the observation findings and recommendations where suitable, but we will provide more background into each issue and members' perspectives. We also are providing advice and inputs with the context of new crew transportation using commercial services and expanding launch footprint around the world. So I think we will be looking through these priori priorities through a lens of speed that is occurring in this industry. To the Comstack members, you've heard today the priorities of FAA and Department of Transportation with regards to commercial space transportation. We have a full slate ahead of us, and I am seeing we are already on track to gather info and talk to SMEs. At the next full Comstack meeting, we will want to have either interim reports or inputs ready for deliberation and voting. To the rest of the industry and public, as we, the Comstack members, embark on these tasks, we want to hear from you and engage with you. Should there be topics of interest that are not identified here today, please let us know. I know this Comstack, this Comstack will have a productive couple of years. 
Uh, with that, I'd like to see if Karina, uh, Vice Chair of Comstack, would like to say a couple of words. Karina? Yes, thank you, Charity. Just, uh, just a couple quick comments and then I'll hand it right back to you. So I just wanna echo a lot of what Charity has said um, and thank this Comstack in advance for the hard work that you're about to endure for the next couple of years. Um, uh, we really look forward to working with you all. And um, you know, this is an incredibly exciting time to be in the industry all across the industry. Um, and so I think we have a lot of opportunities in front of us to really help um, help make the industry successful in the long term. I'm really excited to be a part of it and uh, to be working with you guys in the future. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Karina. Um, so that was what I wanted to say today. Um, uh, this new batch of uh, Comstack members, new tasks ahead of us and priorities. Uh, I want to hand it back over to Jim to see if he has any final remarks or um, additional items for us. Jim? All right, thank you. Um, so far, it's been an absolutely amazing Comstack. Uh, I do want to say a few thank yous. Uh, thank you to Secretary Chow, Administrator Dixon, Associate Administrator Monteith, uh, Executive Director Liu, and Director Underwood for your presentations. Also to Scott Pace um, for a, a great presentation as well. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Charity and Karina for helping put this together and for leading this uh, great meeting. Uh, I'd like to also thank all the Comstack members uh, and also the public for participating uh, and for being here and for your support of this industry. Uh, I know many of you in the public who are, who are tuned in either on live stream or here on Zoom are, are members of that industry, but there are also others out there who are watching who are supporters. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, if you have any questions Again, please direct them for FAA questions to press office at FAA.gov. It's on your screen. If you have questions or comments directly for Comstech members, uh, please go directly to them or to their industry office. Um, and then a couple last things. Uh, today's slides will be available on the Comstech website uh, either later today or tomorrow morning once we get get them through the, the hoops and get the technology to put them there. Uh, and I would like to finally recognize and thank uh, FAA's AOC for their production. Uh, also our FAVES technicians that helped set up the Zoom and control this. And then Tom Murata and the AST team that has done such an outstanding job of doing this. This is uh, unprecedented. This is our first Comstack, I believe it's ever been done virtually. Uh, I think it has gone well, and we are learning as we go. Uh, and I think uh, this has been a great time. So with that, uh, again, thank you, Charity, Karina, for your leadership. And I will formally adjourn this public meeting of the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you all. Goodbye. Hey, guys. Kill it.